Hello folks and welcome to our game with myself Shane Stapleton, joined as ever by Michael Verney. Michael, how's tricks with you? All good Shane, yeah, all good. Uh, mad busy weekend and uh, plenty of upsets to boot as well, just goes to show you particularly with uh, probably with Newcastle West and commercials that yeah, you just can't take any game for granted. And even Nace and Ballyhale, um, we'd maybe written off Nace in some quarters. I don't think we were being disrespectful or anything. It just it was the nature of the odds, the nature of the beast they were coming up against. But definitely for 40, 45 minutes even, they were they were brilliant in that game. Ballyhale's class probably told in the end, but uh, you cannot predict anything. As, as Carrigan showed up in Ulster as well, they nearly caused a massive upset with the Glen too. So... Loads to talk about and loads of juicy finals to look forward to as well. Yeah, without question. Just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgerretro.com. Uh, Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. There's so many brilliant jerseys there, like the ones we're wearing here at the moment, this lovely Mayo one. Maybe even your club uh, colours are like this. So use 15% off and you our, our game and you'll get 15% off, which of course makes for a very handy Christmas present as well. Just uh, anyone who's uh, interested in their football or coaching, and obviously it's so transferable between both codes, whether you're a hurling or football man uh, or woman. Uh, Ger Brennan, Paul Galvin and Stephen Poacher, they're going to be at UCD next Saturday morning at 12 o'clock. So that's going to be an absolutely brilliant show there. So you can check in the video description, the link there, or check uh, any of our Twitter pages. That's going to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, Michael, let's start off with a couple of little bits of news from the last few days. And I suppose one of the ones that stands out is a, a story that you had on um, Mike Casey. So he's not, he hasn't done his cruciate. Absolutely brilliant news. He'll be out for a few months. Um, I think he's he's obviously got some bit of a, a knee injury. He had to come off against Bally Gunner. But it's brilliant news for both him personally, seeing as he's done it before, and obviously for John Kiley and co, not to mention the club, that he's okay. Yeah, I think everybody was fearing the worst, you and, you and me included, Shane, because you know when someone goes down like that and you just it's just kind of that impact injury where you can see the knee bending into the sod and you just don't think this looks good. But by all accounts, it, it's I think it's only a chip bone on his knee, which is in comparison to... Uh, a cruciate, which is nine months, you're probably looking at maybe two to three months. So, um, you know, having potentially people thinking that you might have to write off all the next season with Limerick now, probably be back February-ish, maybe midway through the league, perfect little run in into the championship. And listen, we saw from, uh, from earlier this year, Limerick are going to go through the league and they're going to use it, you know, in the middle of their training. They're not really going to go to win the league. So it'll suit perfect the time that he's going to get back. And it looks like he'll be back and uh, ready to go in, you know, in perfect uh, fit and healthy shape for the championship. So it's a big boost for him and a big boost for Limerick. And uh, listen, it would have been a sickener for him if it was the cruciate again, especially he did it in at the end of 2020, just before the championship started, missed 2020, missed 2021, had more complications with cartilage, missed the club season even in 2021 with the Pierce. got back this year, Never missed the beat, absolutely never missed the beat. And it's funny, I was chatting to his brother Peter after the All Ireland final this year. Um, they've never actually, uh, they've never been on. I think this year was the first time they'd been on the pitch together at the end of an All Ireland, but they've never started an All Ireland final together. So they know, like personally, they'd love to start an All Ireland final together and finish one. So Peter came back from the cruise this year, uh, would have been starting otherwise. Mike was gone the previous years before that. So I'm sure that's something that they'd like to do in 2023. And having him on board uh, and fit and healthy for 2023 and you know a chase for four in a row is huge for Kylie and huge for Limerick and brilliant news for Casey obviously as well who you had on the coaching clinic recently and it's funny you were saying about skills being transferable like any hurling coach could pick up so much from the three football lads this weekend and vice versa with football coaches picking up from the hurling they're so transferable now they're obviously different games but a lot of the, the tactics are both invasion games a lot of the tactics are similar as well so yeah hugely looking forward to that at the weekend yeah, and there's like space creation and there, you're both uh, sports are on the exact same type of field. There's no offside rules, so there is so much transferable. Uh, the other thing, Casey, is at the start of the year, you weren't really factoring him in for the starting team for Limerick because they'd been so dominant without him. And then when he kind of got his place against Cork and he did so well, you were just a reminder of how good he is. So it is a, uh, a huge boost that he'll be available. Uh, Aaron Galan, of course, one of the best forwards in the game. He was lining out with Creed Celtic down in Limerick over the weekend. Uh, I'd say he's not a bad soccer player either, would you? I'd say, uh, yeah, I'd say he's a good man to hang maybe just on the shoulder of one of the defenders and just try and get a ball in over the top. But uh, it was interesting. You'd love to see how he, how uh, you'd love to kind of even mark him for the crack and just see how he'd go because obviously he'd murder either of St. Ireland. But just <laughs> you go in soccer, kind of any man can 
stand in and even particularly I used to play a good bit of centre half and even play a sweeper as well. I presume he's an attacker. Maybe I'm being too simplistic in thinking that maybe he's a centre half. But uh, David Clifford's a centre back or was a centre back underage. That's, that's right, yeah. And even like it's good to see that them boys are they're not exactly sheltered in what they're allowed to do in the winter time. Wasn't the Grohl Hegarty score a great goal that we had up in the the our game you, or, uh, Twitter recently, and Galan is playing a bit as well. So they're kind of left to their own devices. And I don't know if this was part of Limerick trend or not, but you're, you saw recently Kyle Hayes and Keen Lynch and Galan uh, back in the boxing club where they did that white uh, white collar fundraiser a couple of years ago. So they're obviously let go off and do what they want. And while other teams, I don't think by all accounts Limerick will go back a bit later than others. Um, uh, by nature of their season finishing and they did look like they'd gone back later last year uh, and team holidays and stuff like that don't think they've gone on their team holiday yet to the best of my knowledge so um, they'll go back a bit later and be left to their own devices for a while and just something as well Shane that we, we hadn't talked about but uh, Joe Butler who's a Kilkenny man I think exiled in uh, up in Mayo just says a good win for Turin after a very close encounter could have gone either way Turin led for most of the game but Kilimer uh Took the lead around the 56th minute and he just says again, Tareen fought back with eight points from Sean Kenny and Carl Freeman to win by four points. Tareen lost Shane Boland and Kenny Feeney to injury in the first half. Sean Feeney man of the match. So a three in a row uh, for Tareen up in Connacht and you mentioned it on the show last week and it will be interesting to see whether you know there's a, an avenue for them to go and play somebody else in Connacht or step up a uh, a rung in Connacht potentially play senior hurling. I'm not. I'm not sure. We, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out over the next while. Yeah, and I'm just trying to remember what was the the scoreline when they played earlier. Nace played against uh, Turin earlier in the year. It was 18 points to 13. So uh, you know we're going to talk about Nace against Ballyhale, but especially in the first half they acquitted themselves well. Turin acquitted themselves well earlier against the Intermediate All Ireland Champions Nace earlier this season. So maybe the calls for them to go up to senior level will begin to grow, but um, we're going to talk about that more. I just want to mention the uh, Camogie All-Stars team here. So in goals, Aoife Norris, Shauna Healy, Grace Walsh, and uh, Libby Coppinger, Laura Murphy, Claire Phelan, and Saoirse McCarthy. Then in midfield, Ashling Thompson and Lorraine Bray. The half forward line has Denise Gall, Beth Carton, and Julianne Malone. And then the full forward line is Katie Nolan, Miriam Walsh, and Katrina Mackey. So there's an awful lot of uh, Kilkenny in there, plenty of uh, Cork, and then you've got a bit of Waterford and Galway also into the mix as well. So, um, yeah, I suppose, and Miriam Walsh got player of the year. Yeah, and Brian Dowling got manager of the year as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a brilliant year all around for the Cats. And after uh, being unable to go back to back uh, in 2021, I'm sure that's something that they'll have their eyes on in 2023. But you'd imagine there's going to be a kick in Galway. Uh, you'd imagine the Cork are only probably going to get better after integrating a good few new players in. But, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Beck Carton is one as well, Shane, there as well. She had a brilliant year, and she was obviously involved with De La Salle after winning their, their first county title this year as well. So a great year for her too. Yeah, without question. So uh, just some, of the, some other bits of news from recent days. Huge blow for Mayo. Oshin Mullen, he's joined the Geelong Cats. Actually, funnily enough, I just went into a local establishment to watch one of the... Uh, to watch some of the soccer over the weekend and the Australia game was on TV and there was a guy there who's from Geelong and I was talking to him about um, Mullen and I was mentioned in the story that's been doing the rounds in recent days that Mark O'Connor brought some of the Geelong lads down to Dingle while, was it Rob Henley was having his uh, right, stag yeah. party down there? And maybe that was a huge part of the reason why Mullen is, is heading down under. By all accounts, I think it was, Shane. Uh, by mm. all accounts, I think it was. Morris Brosnan has a story there this morning. Uh, and I don't think it was a co like a, a coincidence. It definitely played a, a part in it as well. You said you went into an establishment. Like, Is that just a polite way of saying you went into a bar or a pub, as we say in Ireland? But the only thing is, I wasn't even drinking. I was just having breakfast. No. Okay. At, but you're allowed to say you went into a restaurant or a bar slash restaurant an establishment. <laughs> like Yeah, but not too many restaurants have TVs in them. So, you know, okay. and I, I, I'm not necessarily here to promote drinking either. I'm not against it or anything, <laughs> but I just don't want it to come across like I'm promoting drinking. Um, Rob Heffernan, he's joining Cork as a performance coach. So obviously people who know him, the long distance walker. Um, and also his son, is it AC Milan that his son signed with a couple of years ago? I think ago? so, yeah, yeah. Not sure if he's still with them now, but he was definitely on the books there for a while anyway, yeah. Yeah, what, what do you make then of Galway become the first ever inter-county side to spend over two million in terms of team spending in one season? Now, one thing I'd say is, I wouldn't be surprised if other counties have gone up not too far from this level, but they've found different ways of, 
of paying for stuff. So maybe a sponsor will cover the cost of something and then maybe it doesn't necessarily go through the team books. Because I'd say at the end of the year, counties are somewhat cognizant of how this might be reported in the media. So maybe they find other ways to go about it. I'm only just saying that as a like maybe my suspicion, not based on any one team or anything like that. But I think Galway probably aren't the only ones that are digging this deep. I wouldn't think so. Uh, the one thing about Galway is, I suppose, is you have two teams, um, and particularly this year, they went deep into the championship. They went to semi-finals in Hurland. They went to the final in football. Uh, they obviously have underage uh, teams, particularly the minors and 20s, competing to yeah. the latter stages. The, the minor hurlers off the top of my head were definitely in the semi-final, beaten by tip. Uh, a lot of other teams going to those uh, latter stages, but it is an astronomical amount of money. It's funny, I was reading... Conor O'Rourke in the Sunday Independent yesterday. He, he's still writing for the Sunday Independent uh, at the moment, anyway, which I find uh, interesting to say the least, uh, considering he's an intercounty manager. But he's just saying that his thoughts on um, there being too many people in backroom teams have been completely changed since he went in, and he, re- he says he realizes now that they are all needed, and you do need experts in all these fields, uh, or you're just falling behind everybody else. And he said when he was over schools team and clubs teams, he would like to think that they were, you know, bringing it on to another level and doing as much as they could with, without going deep into resources. But it just as a county level, that it's just a lot of these things are not superfluous. Like, they're actually necessities, which I thought was interesting, and an admission of guilt as well. <laughs> and, you know, uh, when he was a player, he was writing for, uh, doing a newspaper column as well, as was his teammate, Liam Hayes. So I, I asked Colm about that in the past, actually. You can find the interview with Colm that I did, I think, last year just before the all ireland and he does talk about all that stuff and i asked him was it a bit of a distraction but they didn't necessarily find it that way Le- Le- um, liam, re- liam released the book during his career while he was still going and like the book was you could nearly see flames on the pages of the book like and the amount of fires it would light in opposing counties particularly the doves at the time amid that massive massive rivalry so uh it's a very brave thing to do i'd say larry Corbett had a, a diary with the independent after he retired and came back so you'd like a, like imagine now you had a diary or a, a column from an intercounty player like who's going to be competing in like the biggest of the big games like in the middle of the season is unheralded really. Yeah, ML89 says probably only one county with two uh, top quality senior teams with both teams going deep. So most of it going to them. 1.7 of the 2.1 was spent on the two senior teams. Uh, Richard Hogan football before for Hurland in Croke Park next Sunday. Ah, look, I, I don't really mind too much which order they're in, but um, an interesting story is Brian Sheehy being involved in both senior panels for Kilmacud Croaks. And uh, Kieran Dowling, who's the joint manager of Croaks, was talking about it after the game yesterday. He was saying that it's a little bit unfair in him. And I suppose from a personal point of view, it is a little bit unfair in him. Now, um, Kieran also, I think, added that if it was a team from Cork or, or you know, somewhere else in the country. that He things mentioned Lockmore Castellani as well. Yeah, and I suppose the difference there is that you would have a crossover of maybe... 14 players or maybe even more if you're going to talk outside the starting 15 and the other part I'd say is remember when we played the All-Ireland semi-final against Schlock Neal and they were also in the football semi-final they were both initially down for the same weekend and then uh, I think it was moved back a week now the difference there is there was I'd say at least a month before those semi-finals were coming around so there was a lot of room to play with Uh, whereas in this situation it's a very tight turnaround we know when the All-Ireland semi-finals are going to be uh, the final all that kind of stuff so it has to be played off quickly at this point so maybe there wasn't room now yeah you can understand why they'd want to do it as a double header especially for the croaks supporters who don't want to have to pay in twice or travel twice and i know it's not that far away it's only south side of the city and you're going slightly to the north side but for the sake like maybe you could have had one saturday the other sunday now he generally plays he doesn't start for the footballers and he might come on late and you know uh, again kieran said that he's a beast of a player and he could do it but i don't know i mean if, if there was a huge amount of players, I'd say fair enough. But we often talk about the club being held up because one minor player was involved. You know, the full club championship is held up because one minor player or whatever has to line out for his county in a few weeks ahead of time. I don't think you can hold everything up for one player. I do think it's unfortunate for Brian. I think if you could play one Saturday, one Sunday, you'd say fair enough. That gives him a bit of an opportunity. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? I wonder is TV coming into this much in the sense of the games to be broadcasted live and, you know, TG Cat are broadcasting on the, you know, instead of broadcasting on a Saturday and a Sunday, they'd be broadcasting the two games back to back, you know, very, yeah. very m- much easier done, shall we say, from their point of view, whereas it creates logistics and, well. and, and financially, it creates a lot of probably problems for them potentially. So I, I wonder, is that something that, that's in the mix too? Um, if I was to hazard a guess, 
I would say that if the two games are going ahead, that he would probably only tag out for the hurlers. Um, I'd say that's not obviously particularly fair on him, but we have talked about, like, you know, how many times have you seen it in Tipperary? I know I've seen it in Offaly a lot, where with the old rule, with minors allowed to play adult, that, you know, a senior championship could be held up because a guy is playing All-Ireland semi-final with Tipperary, who's minor, do you know what I mean? Who mightn't even mm. necessarily be guaranteed to start for his senior adult team. Uh, it's fair play to him for keep, for keeping it going because he's obviously swimming against the tide in Crokes. Uh, it's interesting, Shane, I saw something, a uh, tweet from Crokes there as well. They were the first team to ever uh, be in Leinster finals at Hurling football and ladies football in the one year. Um, I think Port Leash and I just have it here actually. Port Leash and somebody else uh, did it before. Uh, they, they competed in hurling and football, but they'd never competed in in all three. And of course, when I want to find it, I can't find it. Oh yeah, <laughs> they said we joined Bally Bowden. Bally Bowden actually appeared in the Leinster finals across for, uh, football, hurling, and ladies football. And Bally Bowden, UCD, and Port Leash all played finals in both hurling and f- football. With only Port Leash contesting both in the same year, no club has won both football and hurling titles. So you can talk about how big they are and the numbers they have, or whatever. But it's still an unbelievable achievement for any club to be able to have those resources available. Um, even training wise, how difficult it comes into it logistically, uh, financially, obviously as well. And people that say, "Oh, there's no lack of finances in Dublin or whatever," it's a club as well. There's still serious financial burden on them. So it's it's phenomenal what they're doing. Um, they'll win the football. I'd be fairly confident. The hurling uh, well, it is a different story altogether. But you were saying off air that they're five to one in the hurling. They're five which, to one, and it's like, yeah. was it six or seven points in terms of the handicap as well? I, I thought that was really, um, you know, like I would see it not as a 50 50 game. I think you have to look and say that it, it, it's, you know, Bally Hale are the champions that have been here so often. There's a lot of reasons why you book them. But I don't know if I agree with a six point handicap and five to one, and like Bally Hale are five to six on. You know, yeah. it's, it just seems a small bit of skew. But look, they've battered teams before when you didn't expect it. So who knows? True, yeah. I have been. I have to say I was very impressed with Crocs yesterday. Their pace is frightening at times, uh, particularly up front. And Ballyhale creaked and showed plenty of holes in, in their defence yesterday as well. I know we'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, but yeah, definitely definitely a really interesting hurling final to look forward to. Yeah, looking forward to that. We, we should talk firstly about the uh, the Galway County final over the weekend. St. Thomas's were chasing a five in a row and they have completed it, but Loch Ray made them a bit, play two hours of hurling before they gave it to them. 115 to 17 points for a finish. Mark Caulfield scored 1-3 for St. Thomas's. And if you're going to say, geez, I haven't heard that name too much before with the St. Thomas's team, it's, it's because you haven't. I mean, it's been quite a journey for him this year, but uh, Kenneth Burke has seen him up close and personal with the junior team and uh, saw fit to promote him, and it's worked out very well. Yeah, it's worked out unbelievably well. He's obviously, he was wearing number six, but he started, I think, right wing forward. Um, he'd been playing with the juniors all year, along with Burke. Um, I suppose a chance to impress your manager and get him to see you uh, up close and personal is, ne- is never a bad thing. He's obviously impressed quite a, quite a lot playing junior. Hit one three yesterday. The goal was an absolute bullet. Brilliant, really brilliant work from Connor Cooney in the way through broke the line, assessed his options a couple of times, gave the perfect hand pass to Caulfield, who was, you know, running in motion and an absolute bullet of a finish. Uh, I know the hurl was in around where he swung, but it, the, when you're striking at that sort of speed, it's very hard to block a shot like that. It won two in the first half. He added another one uh, in the second half. Uh, you know, I thought Loch Grey would put it up to Thomas's again, and they did, and they ran them so close and had a chance... Had a chance to draw it again at the end. Um, yeah, Neil Keary, like he just, was carrying the ball. And, he, and the commentator said that he could have carried it another 20 yards. And he could have for sure. But I don't know, maybe he felt that the strike was on. He had loads of space. He is a very accurate shooter. Like he scored one brilliant point in the first half where he was maybe 45 yards out. And he was kind of facing straight towards the goal. So he actually cut across it. Like it was a really nice score. He's a good free taker. And yeah, I don't know. It was just... He definitely could have carried it a bit further, and I'd say he didn't. He had a sleepless night last night. Yeah, there was a man inside him as well, and he he probably he didn't. He kind of wanted to plant his feet, but rushed the shot a bit. It looked like he didn't plant his feet as well. Probably could have brought it in a small bit more. But listen, um, we're we're all experts looking at looking at it from here. Um, that was that that was a you know he obviously thought that was the best thing to do. It's unfortunate the way it worked out. You'd have to say uh, over the course of the season, this is the first game Loch Ray have lost all year. Um, and they pushed the county champions, the five in a row winners, so close. You'd have to imagine 
that Loch Grey are going to come back over the coming years and going to be a massive, massive force. Uh, nobody has really pushed Thomas's this close. They've been pushed close. I think their last four wins have been by a cumulative of eight points, I think. But they, they were pushed so close here. Um, fair play to Loch Grey. They left absolutely nothing out there. Every blow they took, they, ca they came back and delivered another one themselves. They had a goal chance as well. Uh, they had a good goal chance themsel themselves as well. But Fintan Burke put in a fantastic block. Again, the feet were probably just planted. He probably The attacker probably thought he had a bit more time than he actually had. Burke got a great block in. Those type of things are, you know, these are the really small margins that make a difference. Again, it looked like a belter of a game. And I just actually saw a comment yesterday. Uh, people were, some people online were saying, wondering why the Galway final wasn't on TV or why there's been no Galway kind of action on TV. By all accounts, I think the Galway County Board are happy enough not to have their games on TV because they've been make, they've been absolutely creaming it in on, on the streaming service. Um, and by all accounts, they did so again yesterday. So some people wondering why maybe Kilmacud are on TV the whole time. Uh, it's a lot to do with the clubs involved and it's a lot to do with uh, the county boards or the provincial boards involved as well. Whether they think they're going to make more money off the streaming or more money off the attendances coming in. But uh, two great games in Galway and... Thomas is lucky to survive, but they have a, get, they've developed a serious knack of doing that in recent years. Yeah, I actually wonder what do people think out there and get your comments in. The two million that was spent on on um, on the teams this year, and some of that would have come from the stream, and I'm sure. Do people think that would be better off spent on clubs, or are they happy enough to see it spent on the inter-county team? Uh, so just get your comments in on that. Now, I was just wondering about Conor Cooney, and uh, Morris Brosnan had this up afterwards. Late All-Ireland semi-final uh, heartbreak. Without key players, Shane Cooney and James Regan brought to a replay. Still no stop in St. Thomas's five in a row. What a team. Connor Cooney finishes with 479 the club championship. Late fleet frees were clutch. And another thing I'd ask is, does anyone dominate their inter-county or their club championship quite like Connor Cooney has been done in recent times? And another thing I want to bring up as well is, when that goal was scored by Mark Caulfield, Connor Cooney broke through the centre of the field. He burst one lad with his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Then he took off with a solar run. And what he did brilliantly was a couple of times he looked around him as he was soloing and the ball and the ball was still on the hurley. And that's one of the most impressive and important skills that a, a really good forward can have, the ability to look up while they're soloing. Obviously, you can only do it for a split second, really. But if you're able to scan while you're carrying the ball, you know, that's where Xavi and Iniesta and all these players in soccer were always that step ahead. But any good forward, that's something you need to be practicing. To be honest, anywhere on the pitch, really, because now everyone's expected to be able to carry the ball. But it's such a huge thing. And he really has been, I'd imagine, the most dominant player in uh, Galway in the last number of years. But is there anyone coming to mind when you think of players within their own county championships who are really dominant? Uh, in the Galway championship, I would have said even, you know, in the past 10 years and when Portumna were flying, like Joe, Joe Canning did dominate games. But he was mm. also probably dominating at county level. Uh, Cooney probably hasn't scaled those heights at county level, maybe, but at club level, he's been he's just been an absolute rock for them. He's also been captain for all five, hasn't he? Which is unbelievable. Is yeah, I think he's been captain for all five, which is unbelievable. Um, you know, it's it, there is obviously a big step up between uh, club and county. He's been a, you know he's been a good county hurler, but at club level. He's he's on a different and it, like just there was one of the frees inside his own sixty five into it the teeth of a breeze go facing into Salt Hill into the town and it was just you know it was a huge huge score and like there the difference is really in games like this um I don't know how many times I've seen him kind of bail them out when they really really needed it um and yeah another brilliant performance yesterday and they're back exactly where they wanted to be. At the start of the year, they wanted to be in an All Ireland semi final. They're going to be facing uh, the Ulster champions, uh, be it uh, Schlock Neil or Dunlai. And they're going to, you know, they're going to be favourites to be in an All Ireland final probably as well. And favourites to get a shot at redemption against either potentially either Bally Hale or Bally Gunner. That's not to say that Bally A and uh, Kilma Kud won't have something to say in it as well, but they're back exactly where they want to be. And I thought it was funny. Uh, seeing looking at the scenes and the pitch after, I think they realised how much it meant. To achieve five in a row, and in fairness, you'd have to tip the cap to Loch Ray just to see the the Thomases that's fallen to their knees. They know how much of a battle they were in. They wanted to get back and get another shot at whoever it is in the semi final or final, and they're back there. And there was a lot of relief involved in it as well. And where's that music you were going to play to celebrate St. Thomases? Are you going to get that up at all while I read out this comment from ML eighty nine? Can indeed, yeah. 
it's so it goes uh caulfield came on against ballier in the 2017 all ireland semi-final started games in year uh, years after didn't hurl then for a couple of years and came back when kenneth burke took over the team a couple of years ago so that's interesting um you can play that music whenever you like there uh this is obviously it's hard to actually get the the proper tune uh the prop the prop the proper tune uh of the actual song wait let's see if i can actually get it here uh this is obviously very near and dear uh to my heart because we ended uh, famously ended a five a five in a row back in the back in the day and awfully you might just mute me there for a second shane while i'm getting this set up here okay um richard barry says a uh, great win for newcastle west fiahana castle man mainly a hurling club we're never going to win match uh, against fossa anyway but great occasion to have the clifford brothers in cooley row sellout crowd that was amazing 1600 people there complete sellout how how often would you get that joe canning supporter porter that's obviously in relation to the players that dominate within their county championship you'd probably have to say tj reed is somebody that's definitely dominated in kilkenny over the years um, I'm thinking Tipperary and Paddy Maher there for a number of years. He was obviously a hugely powerful player. And I'm just wondering in championships outside of that, if there's anyone else who's really sticking out, Tony Kelly probably and Clare would be another one. Even when he was en route to getting his ankle surgery last year, he was still uh, he was still brilliant um, when he did appear in those games heading up to the final stage. Reggie Perry says, I was disappointed with Conor Cooney in the All-Ireland semi-final against Limerick this year. Oh, Vernie's about to produce. You know, it's probably difficult for people to appreciate now, but for that match, I'm gonna just fast forward to the end. <laughs> you are yeah. not giving an exhibition here. A Ronaldinho type uh, goal. The, the game has gone since. I, I don't believe it could ever again be done. You. <laughs> Great, great you know tune, great tune. In fairness, my presenting skills leave a lot to be leave a lot to be desired. But a great tune, very, very hard to find. Actually, maybe that's because they didn't, uh, because Kerry weren't able to achieve the five in a row in the end. Yeah, you nearly killed the show off with that. I, you, you left me. <laughs> In the lurch on my own there for a couple of minutes. Come here. Um, I was at the Ballyhale against um against Nace match, and I'd say the first half, I just really thought Nace were brilliant, but they left so many scoring chances behind them. They kind of ah, sure look, they kind of left it behind any ch- they needed to be ahead at half time. And really and truly going in a point behind when they created so many chances. Like in the entirety of the game, they actually created one more scoring chance than Ballyhale. Now, people would say, how do you calculate that? And you count it as two chances. If you have a shot, it's blocked, and then another shot. I am counting those situations, so maybe it's not the same amount of attacks. But they had so many scoring opportunities. The first half, there was eight or nine wides, three or four drop short, three or four goal chances missed. If they had to get them all, I'm not saying that they would have went on and won the game because Bally Hale would, you know, they'd generally find a way to come back. But um, any chance they had of causing a shock was probably left behind with the shooting stats. Ah, uh, early on, Shane. Jeez, they totally dominated early on. They like the the Ballyhale defense was like the you know the Red Sea almost or the Dead Sea or whatever it is evaporating there, and it was just people going through. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm, it's the Red I, Sea. I, I, I'm having an absolute mare here the last minute or two, but like they left so many behind. Dean Mason made a couple of brilliant saves. Now I will say too. Yeah, uh, and his first of, time back in Croke Park since the All Ireland. When Ruddle yeah. scored that late goal as well, he so it's big for him. He made, a couple, he made a couple of great saves, but it's just when you're playing, when the underdog is playing that kind of big hitter, you do have to take what chances arise. Like Ballyhale, you know, Nace would have had a buffer of maybe five or six, had a couple of those goals went in, and a couple of like very scorable chances, you'd have to say, for point chances that they missed as well. Um, so it was an unfortunate for them because the opportunities were definitely there. They were the much the better team early on. Uh, you know, they were, I couldn't get over how physical they were and how they dominate, dominated Ballyhale uh, early on. They really, really did. Um, it's hugely encouraging from Anais' point of view. I'd imagine, say, it's hugely encur- encouraging from David Herity's point of view with Kildare as well to essentially come up against a county team and, you know, a team who we have as number one in the power rankings as the best club team in the country at the moment and to be able to display, put in a display as they did the other day is... Um, yeah, it's, I think it's encouraging for Hurling, number one, encouraging for Kildare, number two. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think Tom Mullally kind of laid down the gauntlet to them after, almost saying, I don't know where we're going to be in a year's time, but we saw what we were able to do here today. Can we go and narrow that gap a bit more uh, next year if we're in this position again? So the gauntlet has been laid down, but some serious performances from an ace point of view. Yeah, they were, they were really well set up. 
I have to say that I just thought that they, they did a very good job of protecting their back line, of getting Cahill Dowling in space and trying to get nice ball into him. Like, he's a really dangerous forward. Very impressed with him. It probably didn't quite happen for Brian Byrne in terms of, like, uh, scoring. He got on the ball a nice bit, but unfortunately a few of the chances went wide. Didn't get enough ball into James Burke, I'd say. Jack Sheridan was brilliant. He scored 12 points. Uh, nine of those were frees, and like he was, he was lethal at times. But we can't ignore that there, there was a couple of uh, absence absentees for Nace. Um, I think Simon Lacey, he played with a broken hand, to be fair to him, which is fair going. Sean Gainey was out with a hamstring. Shane Ryan and Richie Hogan, these players, they were out. And there's just, I mean, there was an awful lot that, like, if you're to miss that many chances and have some key players missing, and the lads who came in actually did really, really well. It, it, to miss all those goal chances, it was just going to hurt your team eventually, especially with Ballyhale have all these players who can really step up. Like in the second half, I think right at the start of the second half, Ronan Corcoran got two points in a row, won a free as well that was knocked over. His brother Dara scored three points. Paddy Mullen scored four. Uh, Joey Cuddy got himself a nice goal. TJ Reid ended up with one six after only having a child there earlier in the week. So congrats to him as well. Old Cody was quiet for spells, but then comes up with, with one two. And to me, I think Adrian Mullen, he's the jewel uh, in the yeah. crown at this stage. To me, the, and you know what? There was times he was playing, I was thinking, is he centre back here? He just seems to have a completely free role and goes wherever he likes. And you saw how he punished um, Claire in the All Ireland semi final last year. Now he's largely wing forward, but he just has a license to go wherever he wants. And because he's such a good nose for the ball and he can sort of punish you from anywhere, it just, you know, it just, I thought, um, I think he's up there with the very best players in the country at this stage. Would you agree? Yeah, I I was going through it yesterday. I actually just tweeted and I was kind of going through his attributes. Like there's very little that I think he doesn't have, if you get me. He's mm. strong. He's He can win his own ball. He's a brilliant uh, score taker off left or right. He can attack. He can defend. If you want, you can play him on the inside line. And he was actually near the end of the game yesterday. He was in on the inside line at different stages. He can be back the field. He's brilliant back the field. He's nearly probably better out around where there's, where there's a lot of space. He's a brilliant creator. Um, yeah, I think he has it all, Shane, I have to say. Um, I think he has it all. And after coming back from that cruise, there's signs would suggest that at his age that he's only going to get better and better. I didn't expect, like he was brilliant. Remember that the all Ireland semi-final and that year, the year he'd had maybe after the Wexford game or was it when he got that couple of scores in the Wexford game in the round robin in 19 and he scored a couple of outrageous points against Limerick in that 2019 semi-final in a quiet All-Ireland. Then he did the cruise shit and he's just back now and he's back and, and much better than he ever was. He says, and he's like, I know Jackie said it to me recently that uh, Adrian Mullen was the new leader of this Ballyhale team. And I, I would tend to agree the more the more I look at it. Uh, TJ is going to have to finish up in time in a, in a couple of years, whenever that is. But Adrian Mullen looks like he's taken that mantle on himself already. Um, and yeah, there's there's no telling what, what heights he could scale, Shane. Yeah, Nisha Waldron, who was doing co-commentary for TG Cars, says, one thing that is often not spoken about regarding Ballyhale Shamrocks is their level of fitness and strength. Liv, uh, Nace lived with them as far as hurling went, but the last 10 or 15 minutes looked wrecked. To be honest, they looked like they were getting, they were the tide was turning just before the halftime, even, I thought, when Ballyhale got ahead. And I wonder also, Nace, with the amount of tackling and intensity they put in, and not being so used to playing in games at this level, did they run out of a small bit of juice themselves and ultimately, like, they always played that extra pass, Bally Hale, but never stupidly played it. Now, uh, another man who's involved in the County Hurling Championship is Parik Mahoney. Parik, how are things with you? Well, lads, how's it going? There's the last Not time we were bad. chatting to you, you were, you were a couple of days after celebrating in All-Ireland. I can remember it well. I must be shook, I'd say, at that stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, Parik is joining us ahead of the 2022 AIB Munster GA Senior Hurling Championship final, which takes place this Saturday, December 3rd, at FBD Semple Stadium in Tipperary where Ballygunner take on Ballye of Clare. The AIB GA All-Ireland Club Championship features some of the hashtag toughest players from communities all across Ireland and it's these very communities that the players represent that make the AIB GA All-Ireland Club Championships unique. Now in its 32nd year supporting the club championships, AIB is extremely proud to once again celebrate the communities that play such a role in sustaining our national games. Park, can you tell us about the match you played against the Piershig last weekend? Uh, the intensity was off the charts for club. Like to me, was this a new level of club? Like, how close is it getting to inter county physicality? Yeah, no, I'm not too sure. Like, uh, I think maybe it was a kind of a, maybe had a blend of good quality hurling and the physicality. 
certainly over the last couple of years, I'd say that we've played some club games that have been equally as competitive. Maybe it's just the standard of hurling hat wasn't maybe there alongside it. Um, but definitely, I think the standard of club hurling at the moment is is very high right across the, the, the country. Um, and maybe I think teams are probably putting a lot more emphasis on off the field work in terms of gym, fitness. So I think teams are better prepared now as well. So I think the standard has definitely been kind of raised and raised year on year. Michael? Can I just ask you, Parik, on, on your own performance, I, I'm not going to blow, blow you up too much because I know you've had lads doing that for, for the last week or so, but in your own head, when you hit a couple of early wides, or is, is any part of you thinking, oh, this mightn't be my day or whatever, or do you just, from experience, do you just say, keep shooting, keep doing what you're supposed to do? Yeah, and um, that's it, I suppose. You know, within the group in Ballygunner, like, we're a very close-knit group and kind of no one kind of really, there's no blame game or there's no, you know, questioning someone, you know, once you're kind of doing the right things and trying to do the right things, um, you know, that's all we ask of each other. And that's no different, I suppose, with me hitting the freeze. You know, no one knows that. Everyone knows, sorry, that you're not deliberately trying to miss a free like So, um, but again, for me, it's just kind of resetting and, trying to maybe make do something positive with the next play, whether that's something simple like get a hook or a block in or, you know, win a ball and just lay it off to someone. Something as simple as that can kind of get you resetting and just focusing on the next ball in. Has Tony mm-hmm. O'Gregan had a big influence with G Park? I know you mentioned him before, but even with you, you're going through a you know a free taking routine where, you know, repetition is so so important and doing the same thing over and over again. Has has he helped you personally and just as a team as well? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely benefit the group. Um, I suppose from my own side, I kind of haven't changed anything in terms of routine over the last number of years. And probably, you know, as you can see, it's the same um, routine for the last probably say ten years plus years. Uh, but obviously, from uh, a mindset, you can definitely tweak things, and even in terms of the build up to to a play. But I, I suppose as a group, we we kind of it's more so just the whole you know dynamic outside the of the pitch maybe that we're trying to work on as, be- as best as possible. And I think, you know, if you're coming to the field every night with a clear head and a clear, you know, in, in a good place, I think naturally you're going to give a lot more, you're going to get more out of training session, you know, so it's, I suppose it's trying to find that balance between having a good structure outside your, 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 the hurling pitch to allow you to actually nearly bring and perform on the, on the hurling pitch. I was just thinking at the end of last year, uh, Park, after you won the All Ireland, and then Liam Cattle was being asked about getting you know all the boys back in, and he said it'll take a while to get you up to the pace of inter county after you know. And we would have looked at the game against Ballyhale and said, "Wow, that's at a serious level." Like, did you find when you went back that there was an adjustment period because county was that bit uh, you know way uh, ahead of club? Yeah, look, there definitely is a step up. Um, there's no point saying any different. There, 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 there is a difference in 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 intensity when you, when you go into the inter-county game. And maybe, I don't know, sometimes it feels like a lot more gets let go maybe at, at inter-county because maybe the crowd and you don't, you know, like simple things, you don't even hear a chop at inter-county level because it's, the noise is just, the stadium could be could be shaking at the time. So there is, there's definitely an, an adjustment period. But I, I don't think it takes that long to get to the, to the level. Like obviously from, from our side last year, you know, we would have, we'd like to think that we were preparing as well and training as hard as any in the county team. So that has to definitely get you to a certain level. So maybe the extra 10, 15% then is just getting back in around the group, a couple of games, a couple of internal games, and then you should be at the pitch of, of where you need to be. Hmm. Is, is life easier when you're uh, during the club part of the year or the county part of the year? Where, where do you get your most enjoyment? Yeah, like, I suppose it's hard to, it's hard to kind of say when you're winning, I suppose, Wherever you're, wherever you're winning, it's more enjoyable. But from from our, from our side, obviously, there's there's huge satisfaction about I suppose achieving something big with your club. Um, and you know, obviously, last year was was uh, couldn't couldn't get any better for us. But even this year too, you know, even the hard kind of slog that we would have done with the club, having that kind of gap between inter county and club season was nice. Um, and being around the lads and. You know, there's always, obviously a great crack. There's a, a huge mix between, you know, lads 17, 18 compared to lads, say, who are in their 30s. And it's just, it's, you can kind of see how things kind of move on naturally in, 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 a, in a GA club too. And it's, 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 for us, maybe at the other side, we're kind of trying to maximize every opportunity that we get. But 
there's a huge lift that you get from seeing young lads come in 18, 19, and they're so much into their diet and the gym. And, you know, you're like, Jesus, if we were only like that, when we were 18, 19, what could we, what could we achieve? And, you know, but so it's, uh, yeah, the, at the moment, we're just really, really enjoying the club season. I think mm. Philip mentioned it before, Park, about um, even being motivated by the likes of Desi and even your, a couple of your younger brothers as well, seeing the level that they're trying to take it to and they motivate you a bit more and kind of push you to push yourselves even a bit more. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, obviously we're all trying to learn and to develop. And even as, you know, you look at Shane O'Sullivan, for example, he's arguably adding to his game, you know, at 36 or 37, um, which is obviously a credit to him. But we're all very much kind of open minded within the team to kind of, and, you know, whether that's someone like, you know, in a, we see something, whether it's rugby or, something in the World Cup, you might, you know, hear, see an interview or hear someone say something, or, you know, it's easy to see how that could be adapted to, to hurling. And obviously Desi coming back in definitely brought and new ideas, but also probably brought huge new energy to everyone that we do in Valley Gunner. And um, yes, we're very much grateful for that. Mm. Desi's a bit of a cheat code, isn't he, out in the field? The, re the rest of the clubs, we all find it very unfair that you, you were able to add him. He's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but like to be fair, you look at you know the what people don't see is the work that Desi does off the pitch. Um, you know, he he's he, he nails everything, I suppose, in terms of his preparation. And he'd be the first day on the pitch doing shooting. He'd be could be the last off the pitch. He's the person who could be you know doing extra work, whether it's tackling or you know he's also into better himself. And maybe that's I suppose the environment maybe that he would have seen over in Brighton um, but yeah and I suppose when you have someone like that coming back into the to our setup then in Ballygunner you know all of a sudden young lads see it and they think maybe maybe that's the norm maybe that's what they need to do and if I want to be as good as Desi or play with Desi well, that's that's the level I need to get to and so it's just creating a good environment. Did um were all your brothers always destined to be hurlers? Obviously, Philip is older than you, so he kind of plotted the path first. But were Kevin and Mikey always likely to be hurlers as well? Yeah, I suppose maybe. Um, you know, if you look at the group of player, the group of lads that they would hang around with when they're younger, like obviously involved in in the senior panel at the moment, the likes of Paddy Levy, Kevin, you know, Sean Harney, Owen O'Brien. Um, Gavin Cobb, all these young lads that are coming in that maybe are uh, you know either on the panel or on kind of our intermediate panel and starting at the intermediate team, they all kind of hung around together at the same age. So it's, it kind of makes it a lot easier then where you kind of think you're going off and meeting the lads and here you're bringing a hurley with you. And I suppose it's just again starts young and, and you can kind of you kind of follow the same path as your friends or as maybe your in, in our case, maybe it was they see me and Philip the owners that they thought yeah, that's the way I have to kind of go myself. But I suppose never, we would never have been put under too much pressure as such when we were younger to, to you know, you have to play hurling. We would have, and I still would encourage any young lad to play as much sports as possible, whether it's, you know, Gaelic football, soccer, rugby, golf, whatever it is. Um, and then eventually then you, you'll, you'll make up your mind where you, where you kind of want to, um, I suppose what you want to pursue is, because you can't obviously do them all, and when you get to the maybe 15, 16, you have to kind of make some hard choices. Hmm. Can I just ask you about the semi final at half time the last day, Park? Um, was there a fair bit of figuring out that you needed to do at half time? And how, uh, how much trust or faith did you have in what you're doing when you know you've gotten over the line, if you get me? If that had been a couple of years ago, would, it, would, it have been, would there have been maybe a slight bit of panic at half time where it doesn't look like there was any the other day? Yeah, perhaps. Um, I suppose it's, it's hard to tell whether last year had an impact on how we responded the last day. But, you know, I think we, on reflection, we knew that there was certain things we were actually doing pretty well in that first half. But when you're coming up with, against a team with the calibre of players that Napiercy have, they were always going to have a spell where they were going to dominate. Um, so perhaps maybe five points was we kept it to a manageable level because you know, maybe that could easily be in seven, eight, nine points. Um, so, yeah, I think that, uh, we just knew that we needed to do more of the good stuff in the second half, and, and thankfully we did. How but, how wary of you, are you going into the Munster final as well, Parik, of the fact that, like, let's call it a spade a spade, and we've done it here on this show as well, we're already, like, building up to an All-Ireland semi-final rematch between yourselves and Ballyhale, even though neither of you have won your provinces yet. 
you have a fair task in front of you uh, against Ballier. Yeah, and I think, look, this team, I know we, people probably maybe don't believe when we're saying it, but we've always looked one game at a time. And whether that's the first round of, you know, a county championship match in, in Waterford, the first group stage, I think we kind of pride ourselves on being able to be at the pitch of things of where we need to be in terms of our preparation, our mindset, and our, our performance um, for no matter what game we're playing. Um, because you know you need to you need to practice this. You can't just turn up on the day of a big game. Like if we weren't doing it all along, and next minute all of a sudden we came to last Sunday's game where maybe things were up another level, um, we would have been blown out of, out of that game. So, uh, we, and again, you know, you just talking ahead to this weekend um, you know you think back a couple of years ago when we played Ballier inside in Welsh Park I know it was another classic game um, where I think we, we were we were three points down with, with 30 seconds left on the clock I think and Philip doubled one into the net so you know we, we know the challenge that we're facing this weekend and certainly not looking beyond it uh, Nisha Waldron who obviously played with you in Ballygunner for a while he said this is about your, your answer on your brother's go away boy if the boys didn't play a hurling they'd have been thrown out of the house Oh, I don't know about that now, I don't know. Um, we're all uh, very much keen into the golf and there's a few other sports there. I actually remember years ago, um, I'm not sure what age it was now, but I was playing soccer, hurling and rugby and um, the road clashing on one Saturday morning and I ended up going playing the rugby match. So um, it wasn't completely plain sailing in terms of the direction we were going, whether it was going to be hurling or nothing else. So, How did you justify going playing rugby ahead of, ahead of uh, hurling? I don't know. I'd say I must be about 13 or 14 at the time, but because I remember I had the hurling manager on, the soccer manager on, the Roy giving out. So at the time, maybe I had an idea. I, I was playing, I think, out half. So maybe I was trying, thinking I was going to be rolling over harder at one stage. But that was back, I think I think a year later, I was after finishing playing rugby. So it didn't make too much of a difference. Um, what, what did you think when you heard the news that Davy Fitz was taking over the Waterford job? Yeah, it's very exciting for everyone in Waterford. Um, you know, I suppose if you look at where Davy's been over the last number of years, um, success has followed. Um, and obviously, I would have worked with Davy in 2011 in, in with Walford as well. And obviously, I can, you know, he, he was bringing a new kind of standard that we weren't aware of, I say, in Walford around that time. Um, so you can only imagine now with another maybe 10 years of, of managerial experience under his belt, what he's learned. And um, so yeah, it's it, the players are obviously very very excited to get going, and I suppose you're kind of just uh, you know you want to kind of get a, get a good block of work done now between now and maybe you know league and and then obviously you know really hit the ground running for championship this year or next year. Mm. Uh, when when people look back at this year, a lot is said about you know how it went wrong, and people are saying oh that you know Jim McGinn is coming in and doing a session, and a lot is thrown at that. <laughs> What difference did that make having Jim in? The, what was the session like? I'm not too sure, really. Like people can look if we went out and we bet Cork that day in Welsh Park, you know, the whole year could have been completely different. It's really it's it's Munster Championship is so competitive, and um, as you can see, like last last year, if you look at it, that Saturday night down in the Gaelic grounds, like we I think it was three points in it maybe at the end against Limerick. Um, if you know, poke the ball. Maybe if we got a draw that day, things could have been completely different for for the remainder of the year. So, you know, Munster. If you get out of here, out of the province, you know, first, second, or third in the in in the group, I think you're in a very strong position. Then going into the All Ireland series. But as we've seen, you know, we probably thought we were in a relatively good position going into that Cork game. And you know, as we've seen after Cork. Uh, Cork, Limerick, Clare, Waterford, Tipperary, you know, anyone can beat anyone on any day and that's the joys of Munster Hurling, so just like that, the year was turned upside down, yeah? Yeah, yeah, and uh, not to press too much with the gym thing, but did he do anything like kind of tactical with you, because obviously there's such cra crossover between football and hurling, or was it just more just a normal session or a running session? No, like, again, it's kind of just, I suppose, trying to, he yeah, probably had a similar kind of, um, Plays come from a similar place where they were maybe a good few years back, um, and just trying to get an extra percent or two. Really, that's all it was about. And obviously, if 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 you know if we if we performed against Cork, well then you know nothing nothing we said about it. And ultimately, at the end of the day, as as players, 
did not didn't didn't perform to the level that we're capable of in that game, and and ultimately, you know, we have to look at ourselves first and foremost. Hmm. It'll be good fun when you come up against Tipperary next year. <laughs> yeah, it will it will no doubt. Um, but yeah, look, I think it's uh, obviously it's a good while away now, but it won't be long coming around at the same time. But I think um, you can be sure that Tipperary are going to get a huge kick. Uh, Liam going back in there, and um, obviously from more of a side too, just plenty of new managers right around the country this year. So I think there's definitely going to be exciting uh, 2023 championship. Yeah, Michael? Just uh, personally yourself, Parik, um, you obviously 2020 and 2021 were kind of uh, badly undone by injuries and maybe you probably didn't play maybe as much last year as you'd like coming back from the club campaign. Is there a bit of like unfinished business with the with the county season next year whenever that does come around? Yeah, like I suppose when you get to my stage, you're probably kind of you're assessing everything really, and I suppose with Davy coming in, it does definitely give you a kind of a, a new lease of life, um, definitely. Um, and obviously, at the moment, it's kind of hard because you're trying to completely your sole focus on Bally Gunner and trying to maximise the year that we have in front of us with Bally Gunner, and then obviously you kind of need a break um, to a, to a certain degree before you can kind of you know. Um, I suppose throw your throw your lot in with water and that and then initial conversations with Davy, that's 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 the plan. So it kind of makes it a lot more exciting knowing that once we finish up with Valley Gunner, there's gonna be a, a window there where we can kind of recharge the batteries and and then go for help for letter with water. So I think all the Valley Gunner lads are obviously hugely excited about the point with Davy. We'd love to we'd love to know uh what what the names of all the personnel of all the Bally Gunner lads are, but I doubt I doubt we'll find that out maybe till uh, closer to the time because I I'd be I'd be hoping from a hurling point of view anyway that your that your goalkeeper might go back in, but that might be something uh, that might be something we'll find out down the road. Yeah, I'm not too sure now. Um you'll have to talk to Stephen on that one. <laughs> Yeah, he's been. I'd say he doesn't even want to do interviews at the moment because anytime he does one, he's just been asked about that, isn't he? Yeah, no, it is. I suppose it is. And look, I, 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 to be honest with you, I haven't had a conversation with him either because I said we're solely focused on Ballygunner now at the moment. And um, any conversation that we'll be having now is about what we're going to try and, you know, what we need to do for the weekend and whatnot. So, um, or else it's on the World Cup or the NFL or something like that. So there's plenty of distractions out there at the moment. And to be worried, in, 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 I suppose, what's happening now rather than what's going to be happening in a couple of months' time. And are you stuck into the World Cup at the moment or are you interested? Ah, uh, yeah, no, we all are, I suppose, sure. I suppose it's, it's hard not to be when there's matches on the telly 24-7. But um, obviously last night, I think we, we had a... We had a I know we had a cracker last night, so I, was, I think um, from here on in now, once it kind of gets to the last 16, I think everyone will, will be good to it. Mm, absolutely. Well, look, it's been brilliant chatting to you, Park. Really appreciate you coming on, and best of luck in the final this weekend. Cheers, lads. Thank you. Cheers, Park. Good man. Okay, so that was Park. So there's a few more comments about the, the Nace Bally Hale game. Uh, John McEwen did a savage marking job in TJ in the first half, kept the ball out of his hand. Jack Sheridan and Dowling were very good. They'll be up around the top in Leinster for a while to come. And, you know, you kind of already mentioned that, that Tom Mullally did lay down the gauntlet to his players that, you know, you know, he said that, um, he said, uh, all I know is today that there's gaps between us and the Shamrocks and it's whether we can stick together in the, is the first thing. Secondly, whether we have the ambition to close up those gaps and that will only reveal itself over the course of the next 12 months. Um, in a way, it was kind of like the best, I mean, this is, you know, not strictly, but the best of Kildare against the best of Kilkenny because a lot of the star players are from both of those clubs. And for, for a long spell, they held up well, which is probably a good thing for David Herity, the Kildare manager, even going into next season. Yeah, I thought they had them frazzled at different stages as well, Shane. Like, how many times did... There were lads scrambling. Even Richie Reid was one player, definitely not a couple of times going, scrambling kind of for a ball. They, were, they really had them frazzled, I'd say, mentally. But they were able to... Ballyhale were able to regroup as they do at half-time really, really well. But interesting to hear um, Pat Hoban's comments after. Now... Personally, Shane, I think Bally Hale would be absolutely delighted because they haven't oh. really, they haven't, like, they haven't, you're, you're, oh. <laughs> you're like, an, an, I know, you you're know, like, like, you're like, you're like Nisha on call commentary yesterday, Mr. <laughs> but, Mr. Sound Effect. But trying to, you know, in a way, wouldn't it be great to try and frame a 12 point win as disappointing? Yeah, well, he well he did, Shane. To be honest with you, because uh, he just came out. He came out with some strong enough comments after, which were which were good. And I definitely think he's laid down the gauntlet to them. He just said uh, it was Nace led by six early on. And he said it could have been more. Our goalie pulled off two great saves, and they had at least four or five scoreable wides. Nearly unbelievable to be ahead at half time. Beyond the scoreboard, they outworked us. 
They were uh, bullying us around the middle of the park, and uh, we had intercounty players being pushed around the place. Nays are a big, physical, athletic team, and they really proved it. He also talked about um, some showboating at the end, what he deemed as showboating from some of his players at the end, taking on shots and doing some different things like that. So he has a massive stick to beat them with going in this week. And as I said, I do think it's perfect for Ballyhale. They've been playing really good stuff the whole way through, but they've been really been uh, not obliterating teams. Outside of Tullerone, they probably haven't really been tested in a while. They were tested for 40, 45 minutes, really, really strong here. So it's probably perfect preparation going in. And particularly at the back, Shane, it looked like there was a lot of holes in defence. Uh, it, like there was way more goal chances than I've seen and remember I was saying to you Jack Gallagher the little diminutive player for Castletown Gagan got five against them when they played the Westmead champions there was more kind of holes here at the back um, and it's definitely something that would probably be alarming enough for them but something that they'll try and address um, in the week between the two games and no doubt they will address it now, in the grand scheme of things, Kilmacud Croaks were excellent against St Mullins. They won 124 to 112, and even at that, it was a late enough goal for Connor Kyo, who was very impressive for Mullins. That kind of took some of the bad luck off the scoreline, if we want to put it that way. But there were times, especially in the first half, when Croaks did look a little bit as susceptible to a crossfield ball or two that were going in. Obviously, there was a penalty won early in the game, and I think. Bill O'Carroll is very, very fortunate uh, that his high that's, tackle. Yeah, that's a red. That's a red for me. They're like that's not uh, whatever, but cynical I tackle. I just thought it was. I just thought it was really dangerous. I have to say, like really. Yeah. So th this Jason O'Neill was burning through, and he put his arm up, and you can imagine he is just trying to foul him for uh, a penalty because. I think in most situations, you would rather your goalkeeper faces a penalty than someone coming in one-on-one -on -one and they're oh, about yeah. five yards or ten yards out. So you can see why he'd foul him. Uh, I don't necessarily think he was looking to grab uh, Jason O'Neill by the head or helmet, but he did. So he was very fortunate to get away with a red there. But then a couple of minutes later, he, he uh, I think he, and again, I don't think he intentionally did it, but he lost the race to the ball with Jack Kavanagh and flicked Jack Kavanagh across the face guard with the hurley. So there's no way it shouldn't have been two yellows. And you know me, I'm not looking for any cards in general in Hurling. I want to, it to be as physical as possible. But when when you think that Marty Kavanagh missed the penalty, and it was a very disappointing day for Marty. We, we've sung his praises many times, but it didn't really happen for him in this game. But it was a huge turning point because if Mullins had to go a man up, maybe they managed the game that bit better. Maybe they calmed down. Maybe the holes and mismatches that are appearing in their own backline don't become such a problem and they don't get blown away as ultimately they were. And maybe Paddy Boland, who was excellent, and James Doyle at times, who did some good stuff, maybe they can they can you know get even more change and maybe Marty Kavanagh will grow into the game and whatever. But uh, ultimately, the red card didn't happen. And then you had the likes of Oshin O'Rourke going to town. He scored uh, 11 overall, seven of those from place balls. Fergal Whiteley scored three. Ronan Hayes, who was stone mad for goals from the start of the game, he scored 1-1. I thought Michael Roach was brilliant at corner forward. And I thought Dara Purcell absolutely ran the game. So he wore number 13, but he was floating around the field everywhere. Scored three points. There was a run in this first half where he set up four chances in a row with stick passes, and they were all scored as well. So I think it can't be overstated how well he played. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, no, I listen, the game potentially could have been different had uh, had O'Carroll been sent off and obviously had they got that goal as well. Um, I would always say the same as you. It, it's it's a killer when you're through on goal like that. And like realistically, it's a certain goal. It's a 95% chance of a goal if that's one-on-one. -on -one. Taps it either side of the keeper and it's a goal. The penalty is anything but. And Marty, uh, Marty Kavanaugh obviously slipped. And it was interesting to hear Morris Aylward say after, like, you know, he felt maybe the, he said felt maybe the game could have been different, but he also said maybe we needed a thirteen against fifteen the way we were playing. He just he couldn't get over how poorly they played. And was Cole Park doesn't suit them. Like to be honest, they they needed a slower field, didn't they? Really? Potentially, yeah. Like Kill McCord are just such a fit, mobile, athletic side. The use of the ball <laughs> was athletes so good. everywhere. Yeah, athletes absolutely everywhere. Um, that's why it's going to be really interesting when they play Ballyhale. And Nisha said it there, and it probably is understated. Ballyhale are unbelievably fit and athletic and mobile and they will stay going and going and going and going and Crow Park suits them down to the ground. So that's going to be a fascinating final. Um, and the, the chances of it being a high scoring affair are pretty high, I'd say, given uh, what, both, uh, what both teams can put up and even what they put up at the weekend. And you said uh, Nace had more scoring chances than Ballyhale had and they still put up a huge score. 
Uh, but Kilmacoda are settling into Leinster really, really nicely after that disappointment last year. Went about their business really professionally against Clock and went about their business pretty ruthlessly yesterday as well, you'd have to say. And just wrote back to Ronan Hayes for a second as well. Um, this is like every time he got the ball, no matter where he was, he was thinking green flag. It's it's kind of it's it's it was a it was a mad one. I don't know, but like he was obviously kind of playing in a new position yesterday at times as well. He, we know him maybe more so for being in the edge of the square. He was out the pitch a good bit yesterday, maybe at eleven at times. But um, I don't know if that was a, a directive or whatever he was given. But they obviously in their heads they were they were thinking and collectively they were thinking we need to run at these and we need to put them on their back on the back foot. He definitely took it uh, took it as a direct instruction anyway. Yeah, like he has been quiet in recent games. So maybe it was a case of just a change is as good as a rest and it might freshen him up. And I think it did. And I thought he was good. And I think they targeted the fact that, say, Mullins probably were lacking pace in certain positions in the back line. And definitely there was um, an, an athleticism deficit between the two teams, which is always going to be exposed at Croke Park. But um, look, Mullins, it just wasn't their day. Maybe they can come back and go again. But um, I think maybe part of the reason that Kilmacud Croaks are 5-1 to one for the final with some uh, bookmakers out there is Davy Crow, who's an excellent young uh, player, and he, he's been playing midfield. He's got a broken hand, so he's definitely out. Mark Grogan, their centre-back, who's a re- very good player, he came off in the second half injured. Dara Butler also came off injured. He's the full-back. I don't know if, if those two lads are going to be okay for the final, I'd say. At the, at the moment, the management are trying to figure that out. And then you've Alex Considine, one of their county forwards who play inside. He hasn't played since, I think, October the 23rd was the the, the county final against Nafina, and he had a two-match ban. So he hasn't played since then. So is he going to be fresh and firing and all that? I'm sure they'll hope he is. But there's several things there that had, um, that sort of present slight question marks for Kill and they'll have to overcome. But there's a lot of players that, that really did play really well. I think Keno Kahasig is stepping up all the time. Whiteley O'Rourke, Brendan Scanlon, Roach, Con- Quaylon Conway was taken off early, but he's had good games for them, and they obviously see him as a leader. He's the captain. Um, and obviously Hayes as well. There's a lot of good players there, and I think they'll go into it and give it a right rattle. I think most people will favour Bally Hale, but they're definitely going to give it a good go. Just from Michal Dunahoo's point of view as well, you're wondering how many of these guys will be in around a county squad next year, and you're thinking... You're thinking a fair whack at them. You'd have to. You'd have to say um, a lot of them. You know, go, would be part of like, what the modern hurler is: mobile, fit, um, athletic, good on the ball, uh, able to play through the lines. Not kind of headless. If you get me, they're able. They're able to adapt to what's going on around them. Um, and even like Don, who's obviously going to have to work with what he has. And you know, I know that Franny Ford, even when he would have played when, when he's over Rhinus. They would have worked with what they had and they would have played a certain style to suit what suits them. A lot of mobile players they would have played a sweeper at times. Um, so you, And that wasn't, wouldn't be too dissimilar to what Matty was playing for a while as well. Um, so that I, I think he'll be pretty happy with what he's seen in recent weeks, probably since from the county semi-finals onwards, he probably would have happy with what he's seen in Dublin and what he's going to have to work with. They are going to be up against it against Paddy Hale. There's no point in saying any different. But if you know if they're able to, if they get the same chances that Nace had and they're able to convert, uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, so um, Marco Mahoney says Purcell slots into midfield and Constantine goes into 13. To be honest, uh, Purcell was out in midfield anyway because Davy Crow had been injured, so they had to move things around. It's a huge weekend for Kilmacud. Like, to, if they're able to do that treble, that's that's incredible stuff. So we'll move on to the Leinster Intermediate semi finals. Bray Emmett's beat Nave Brogue. Obviously, they've been in the news recently, but uh, Bray saw them off in this one. And Trim beat Tullamore and beat him well, 121 to 19. So the Leinster Intermediate final is Wicklow against Meath. Now, I think that's quite striking, and that's obviously a huge thing for both of these clubs. I'm, I feel vindicated somewhat. I said, I said months back uh, that I thought Bray would give Leinster a good shot, and then I don't know it was a Richard Hogan or somebody came in and said there's probably a distinct possibility that Owlert and Dainsford are going to be in Leinster. I don't think I backtracked too much, but I think with the two of them in there, you couldn't have seen, you couldn't have envisaged a final like this. Um, it's as novel as you get. Trim absolutely dominated Tullamore. Tullamore hit 1-9, all from place balls, all from Shane Dooley, didn't score from play. Like, talk about backing up the win over Dainsford. Trim have backed it up in great style. Uh, Bray only beat Lazarians from Abbey Leaks by a point. Comprehensive enough the other day, uh, 14-7 against Nave Barrog. So, yeah, definitely uh, an intriguing final and uh, a massive opportunity. The, the, the Intermediate Championship has thrown up 
like some like last year we had obviously Turin, they're obviously three in a row champions. We had uh Nace and we had Lichna as well. You know, three teams that are, you know, a little bit off the beaten track. This year you're gonna have one All Ireland semi finalist is gonna be Turin and it's gonna be either Trim or Bray in the other one. Um and it's I brilliant, think, isn't it? Yeah, is it when Sean Kelly devised uh, the All Ireland intermediate and junior club campaigns as president, this was exactly what it was for and if you look at how Nace have gone from intermediate All-Ireland champions to like really putting it down to one of the best teams in the country that's the building block that teams like that need and imagine Shane before this all came in there was nothing for them like outside of the county there was nothing um and just like how do you get better how do you prove yourself how do you you know build yourself up to that step up at least there's somewhat of a ladder there to help you with that uh, ascension through the ranks, and like I, I think it's great, and that Leinster final has such a, it's such a great look to it, and like we'll we we'll do a right good build up to that final because it's so novel as well, and maybe we'll chat to somebody uh, involved or somebody involved in the clubs because imagine what it means to both of those clubs that are involved and the chance to chance to go and play um, in a huge venue and the chance to potentially get on and play in Crow Park in time in a semi final or final as well. Yeah, Nisha says, don't forget Banner. They were the fourth semi finalists in the Inter last year. They're from Derry. Uh, it's a great championship. It really is. Uh, no doubt about that. In the junior semi finals uh, in Leinster, commercials of Rat Cool in Dublin, they beat Blacks and Whites of Kilkenny 2 7 to 10 points. And Horswood of uh, Wexford beat St. Feckins of Loud 1 8 to 1 4. So that's going to be Rat Cool against Horswood in the Leinster junior final. And there's a, a player for commercials. I've been hearing a lot about him lately, Dermot O'Dooling. And I believe he's been called up to the senior uh, Dublin training panel as well. Just meant to be an electric inside forward. And like you were saying, Michal Donoghue is going to need to find players uh, for next year. But So that's brilliant for both of those clubs getting to getting to Leinster finals. The Connacht Intermediates uh, final, we already talked about this. Uh, Turin beat Kalimer of Galway, 22 points to 115. And then the Ulster Junior final, Satanta beat uh, Shane O'Neill's, 122 to 15 points. So uh, that, that's the, the hurling there. We're going to have Chrissy McKay coming on in a few minutes as well. But um, let's talk a bit about football here because Cairns O'Reilly, you mentioned this on Thursday, they'd lost their Kerry Championship games by a cumulative 36-ish points, 35, wasn't it? 35, I think, yeah. 35, 35 yeah. points. And here they are in the Munster final. Yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Um, mm. And there's so many um, stories to this. Obviously, uh, there's two players coming back from Dubai to play. Another player coming back from New York to play. Uh, and by all accounts, uh, Jack Savage kind of seemed to control the game. But between them, the, the three players who are traveling from abroad hit seven of their, you know, one nine tally, which is outrageous, really. Um, it, it's so often that these kind of travel commitments don't really work out and you don't hear about them. But Peter Cook is obviously doing similar coming back from New York and he's playing with... Um, He's playing with Mike Cullen there in the provincial final at the weekend. Jason Lonergan would have did the same with uh, Carmel at the weekend. He was the only one that probably maybe it didn't work out. But it's some commitment uh, to make to your club. And having been, <laughs> having been you know, a non-entity in the Kerry County Championship, they're now in a Munster final. Um, it just This seemed to be a really, really intriguing game. So, Karen Zerahli's lost David Moore quite early in the game. They were... Uh, one nine to one six up, I think, with maybe fifty minutes or so gone. Didn't score thereafter, and we're just holding on, holding on. Uh, Arrow got it back to one nine to one eight on the fifty eight minute, and you're thinking fourteen versus fifteen. Arrow are coming with a bit of a charge. And then I believe the last few minutes were riddled with fouls and black cards and yellow cards and whatever. But Terence or Ali's are after getting over the line, uh, and they've set up. Uh, Again, talking about novel finals in Leinster Intermediate, no one would have predicted Cairns O'Reilly's versus Newcastle West in a Munster final, uh, even as recently as a few weeks ago, I'd say. And I think it's the first time a Kerry team has ever played a Limerick team in a Munster final. I think Fintan O'Toole from the 42 was tweeting that there yesterday. Yeah, like it was quite incredible for Aerog that they'd gotten so close towards the end of the game and then they had a breakaway chance to actually score a goal and win it right at the end. And the, the names of the players uh, escape me at the moment, but they basically had a two or three on one going into the 14 of um, of the Cairns O'Reilly area. And one of the players went to just tap it over the bar, but he didn't hit it hard enough. And it ended up just going straight into the midriff of the one defender that was back. And of course, from then on, the ball was worked back out and the final whistle went. But that'll be heartbreaking because um, no more than Neil Carey when we were talking about Loch Ray earlier on, you have that chance. 
And of course, in the case of the air old player, he was right in on goal. And if you had to draw the defender, hand pass it across for the Pam goal, you're into a monster final. So again, look, this is tough situations for players. There's a lot of pressure on, but what might have been will certainly be on their mind. And I think David Moore, he got that red card. It was two two yellows, so he'll be available for the final. Two innocuous enough yellows by all accounts. Well, he, he probably shouldn't have reacted to the second one, but I do think the player that was tackling him did dunt him across the head. Now, I'm not saying he went to box him on the head, but I do feel that he caught him on the head. So David is rightly upset, but... And maybe it is really difficult to just keep your wits about you and not react in that situation. But, yeah, it's a cheap enough one, really, and uh, it's, it's got to be very frustrating for him. Imagine watching on the rest of that match and thinking the guilt if you did end up losing it. Some test the character for the boys to come through without him uh, and going into mm. a monster final now. And some air miles. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, to be, uh, I'm sure Jack Savage and the boys, uh, the, other, the other two lads, it was... Uh, was Jack Savage obviously came back from Dubai along with Carmel Coffey and Gavin O'Brien returned from New York and they tallied seven points between them, like which is outrageous. And Jack seemed to control things as well. Um, then on the Newca- Newcastle West point of view, Shane, they were big underdogs going into the Clonmel game because Clonmel had obliterated uh, Nemo uh, a few weeks ago playing like champagne football, really, really good stuff. But it's, it's funny, I, I said to you, I interviewed Mike McMahon, the full forward, uh, last week. He was kind of kept quiet, um, and this will kind of show you the job that Adair did in the county final. So he, Mike McMahon went to town in the county final, but they managed to keep like Keane Sheehan and Ian Corbett really quiet in the county final. Keane Sheehan was everywhere yesterday, kicked a load of points. Obviously, we know him as a, he got an All-Star nominee earlier this year, probably partly due to Limerick's exploits of getting to, uh, promoted to Division 2 and getting all the way to the Munster final as well. He was brilliant. But it looked like Clamell had kind of weathered the storm. They'd gotten one up like really deep into injury time. And it was a punt kick over the bar, which you don't normally see it. And it was in amongst bodies. A punt kick over the bar uh, leveled it up. And then when it went to extra time, having looked like Newcastle West had potentially blown their chance in normal time, having been the better team, like they were by far the better team. Newcastle West were uh, in extra time. Managed by Jimmy Lee, who is... Billy Lee's brother and Mike was actually saying this to me last week. They're all, the whole management team is homegrown, which is rare enough. So manager selectors Stephen Kelly, who's uh, one of their one of their favourite sons, a brilliant Limerick footballer, he's involved as coach, and all S and C and everybody else is all homegrown. Uh, and he actually just wanted to accentuate that an outside voice is not always uh, the best voice, but uh, they're in the Munster final now and. Uh, Someone's going to be an all Ireland semi-final and it, wouldn't have, it definitely wouldn't have been predicted beforehand, I can tell you that. Certainly not. Uh, there was a comment there from Porter Porter. Was Jason Lonergan back? He did, yeah. He flew back from uh, where he is in San Jose. He scored three points. One of those was a free, so he did his bit. But when it went to the extra, like when they started extra time, Clamel had 13 men with both Kevin Fahey and Kieran Cannon black carded in the 59th minute and Newcastle West kicked 1-1 in the first half uh, of extra time. So that's obviously a huge turning point as well. Uh, go on, you want, you want to say something? No, isn't it funny? You are doing the right thing in normal time by taking the black card and denying a scoring chance or whatever. Isn't it a killer to be punished? Then? Like, it, does, it doesn't make sense, really, Shane, in the sense of, you know, if you get, you know, they could have been yellow carded or whatever, or they could have been red carded and uh, down to 14 and able to start with 15 again for extra time. But with a black card, you can't start... like. We have to define this clearer when it's a new game and when it's a not a, not a new game. Do you know what I mean? How can you have be down 13 men technically with two red cards and be able to bring them back for 15? Then you get a black card and you can't go back to 15. It's a disaster, really. But uh, some win for Newcastle West and that's going to be someone's for final ahead. Yeah, James Daly says, top class show as always, lads. Detail and everything. That news that you put out about Mike Casey at the weekend was pure relief, Michael. So thanks for that. Um, the Parky Queeve pitch is unlike any other pitch than Croke Park and maybe gave commercials a false picture, says Connor Heaney. I did think Newcastle West would keep it tight, uh, but, but thought that they wouldn't have the score and power. Yeah, I'm, to be honest, I'm surprised I thought Clam Mel would do it. That was probably in my tone when we were previewing the, the game the other day. But Newcastle West, it is against Karen O'Reilly, so fair play to, to both sides. That'll be a tasty final, and you can imagine the scenes at the end of that game. Uh, the Munster Intermediate semi-finals. Doesn't sound like a classic. Again, I'm sure weather was a big factor here, but Napiersig of Limerick beat Ballina of Tipperary six points to 1-3. It, well, sorry, that didn't separate them. 4-2 on penalties, and Napiersig are through. They're going to meet Ratmore of Kerry, who saw off Cantor. 
day of the of the Aiden Walsh and so on, 117 to 26. So that was far more routine. But winning on penalties in a monster semi final, dramatic, brilliant stuff. Very on the Our Game channel over the weekend as well of a chance that Stephen O'Brien had for a goal where it hit the crossbar, came back and hit one of the uh, came back and hit one of the opposition players on the head, and then just kind of fell clear or whatever. But uh, that seemed to be a bit of a mad game. Um, listen, there's no point in saying any different. The Pierce will be big underdogs going into that, despite the fact that I think Paul Murphy is going to be unavailable for Ratmore. They won the other semi final. He's on avail, but I think he's on. I think he got married last year or early this year, and he hasn't honeymoon yet. And he's probably maybe taken in the Kerry holiday as well as part of that too. He's going to miss the Munster final. They'd still be favourites. Um, Matt Moore would still be favourites, but Napierski are going on a bit of a run again. I think they might need to kick. Uh, might need to kick a few more scores than they did at the weekend, but a savage win for them. I'll tell you what, you weren't uh, missing in your honeymoon this year. You left me high and dry doing the show for a few weeks. You just don't have the commitment. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't have the commitment at all, no. And I, I planned it. I didn't uh, purposely plan it, but I, well, I kind of did. It was, it wasn't, uh, in, it was in between the club and county season a bit. So I tried not to leave you hang out to dry, and I tried not to miss any action myself as well. So I think it worked out okay. <laughs> James S says Balnair of Clare. No, it's Balnair of Tipperary. Uh, likes to see. Uh, I tell you, James so. S, you're, you're on ropey, you're on ropey, you're on ropey ground there. I was chatting the horse trainer. Well, he says you're whipped uh, there now. He's after throwing in another comment. The same man, James S. Ah, uh, not at all. No, far from it. But uh, if you, I was chatting the horse trainer Fergal O'Brien, who's from Ballina, but I'd seen it in an article that he was referred to as a Clare man, I think, and he went absolutely ballistic with me on the phone. <laughs> Obviously, Killaloo is one side and uh, Balna is on the other, the twin towns there. Um, but yeah, no, uh, Balna have made a fair rise through the ranks, but they'll be disappointed with that because it probably was a, a good opportunity to get through to a Munster final. Yeah, Conor Heaney says, Cantor were desperate poor, but ninth in Kerry versus 25th in Cork. The gap is understandable. That's a fair point. The Munster Junior semi-finals also took place at the weekend. A sold out, um, what was the name of the venue again? Was it Carry Row or something like that? Cooley, Cooley Row or Carry Row, Cooley. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Fossil How beat, good is uh, that to see, Shane? How good? Like, oh. I was literally beaming with pride when I saw that the other day. I was like, <laughs> people talk, people talking all sorts of wallop about the club game and not being able to go and see your, your you know, your heroes or whatever. The Cooley Road was, Connor, thanks a million. Um, and 1500 turned up and it sold out like the morning. Was it the morning of the game? I think they put that up. Like, that's just brilliant to see. You know, you, have, you had all the the Fiona Castleman uh, kids doing a little guard of honour for the two teams. Like, imagine um, imagine the inspiration it will give them to, you know, to try and succeed their heroes and follow in their footsteps. And even David Clifford after, like, was, there was a great picture of him and Seamus Flanagan going around on social media after. And I think Dermot Burns was there as well. So it's not too often you have the herder, herder of the year and the footballer of the year in the one venue for a game like that. But, Clifford and, and everybody signing, you know, photos and doing things after and taking photos. Um, such a such an inspiration to the next generation. I'd love to do a cumulative time of how man, many minutes David Clifford has spent signing things this year after matches. It's it's phenomenal. He's it's rare he's gone half an hour after a game. I yeah, and I'd say I wonder does it ever get trying for him? Here is here actually is that picture. David Byrne put it up afterwards. So fifteen minutes after the final whistle, I'll learn the winner, Seamus Flanagan and David Clifford take a quick break from signing autographs for a quick chat. So it's, it's nice <laughs> to see pictures like that because um yeah, it's kind of cool, isn't it? It's unique to have those two players playing against each other in a club match. Yeah, well, as I said to you, like uh, Barron, the the provincial club championships, like when are they ever going to get a chance to play on the same pitch again? They're not. So. For Seamus Flanagan, I'm sure that was uh, that was a, a nice a nice little uh, experience to you know share a pitch with what could be and is already is one of the best footballers of all time. So uh, Marco Mahoney says, man of the match for Bray Emmons was the referee. A Wexford ref obviously didn't want to bring Barrow to uh, have Nave Barrow going. Of course, he's obviously referenced in the fact that Owlert were beaten by Nave Barrow in the previous round on penalties as well. Since we mentioned penalties earlier, uh, the Ulster Senior Football Championship uh, semi finals. I wouldn't say there were, well, one of them was, was routine enough um, in that Kilku beat Ennis Gill and Gales by 314 to 1 9. Uh, the other one, Glenn against Cargan, that was 110 to 8. And it was a penalty from Danny Tallon late in the end that fully decided that game. But it was relatively close because obviously, if it's 10 8 going down the stretch, there's always a chance of a victory there. But Kilku are looking just as dominant as ever, aren't they? 
Ah, uh, they are, in fairness, Jen. It looks like they've kind of weathered a few storms that they had. Uh, yeah. Probably throughout, throughout down in particular. They had a lot of storms to weather there. And they've they've come through and they're playing like they're playing their best stuff. It it it, it looks a lot like last year. They've weathered the storm. Um like the semi the, the game against Ennis Gillen on Saturday, they were pretty comprehensive from start to finish. Never uh, there was a bit of a comeback from, from Ennis Gillen Gales in fairness in the second half, but Kilku never really looked in, in much trouble. Um and like listen, we got the we got the got the Ulster final that we wanted. Probably didn't get it from a Glen point of view in as um a comprehensive a fashion maybe as we thought, but that's a lot to do with Cargan. Now Cargan played uh they played defensively enough and tried to stifle Glenn and they did they did at times and the Glenn just came good. Listen, this is the second time in a row that the Glenn have maybe had some troubles. Um Ergil Kieran gave them some troubles as well, but they finished so strongly. They finished really, really strongly. It was just interesting to hear Maliki O'Rourke saying after basically said that it was set up for an upset. So he just um he just said from my experience before semi finals there's no point looking at a final before you get over the semi final. It was set up for a shock. He looked at the odds before the game. It was so lopsided in our favour. And there was a lot of talk about a Glen kill coup final. It's always difficult to shield players away from that. We were in a battle there and delighted the boys showed brilliant character to come through. And again, there's the, the fair bit of character in the Ergil Kiral game as well. So they're maybe not playing as well um, on the face of it as kill coup, but they've overcome a couple of really stern tests in recent games. And yeah, listen, that's going to be a belter of a game. James S just says... Did Kilku and Glenn play last year? They surely did. Glenn beat them, um, even though you had, uh, or Kilku beat them, even though you had Glenn as favourites for the All Ireland. Um, and that was, there was like that was a one that was a one score game. And I know Connor Glass referenced a kind of one mistake that was punished, and Kilku go on and win the All Ireland. Um, so that's going to be a belter of an Ulster final. Yeah, and I'm just thinking. It's only a month or so ago that we had up the coaching clinic in Belfast. We had the two managers that are going to be facing yeah. each other in this Ulster final, Conor Gilligan and Malachy O'Rourke up against each other. And I wonder, were they holding that back in the coaching clinic that day, not giving away every little secret? But uh, it must have been even slightly funny. They both realised, yeah, we could face each other in a few weeks' time. So, you know, I don't know, this, would that cause any sort of weirdness where you're like, oh, I better not say too much here. They'd probably know each other well enough to not mind. I wouldn't say to be too worried about giving any giving anything away. If anything, you could probably maybe go focus on an aspect that you're not going to focus on potentially if they meet in an ultra final or something like that. But um, yeah, that's going to there's, there's some there's some really good uh, provincial finals to look forward to, isn't there? Like the Glen mm. and Kilku is one that we would have you know looked at even as competitive as Ulster was. They're after coming through it now. It was the game we you know looked at maybe probably five or six weeks ago. Um, even Ballyhale and Crokes in the hurling, even though one is uh, overwhelming favourites, that's going to be a belter of a game. And obviously, a Bally Gunner against Bally A at the weekend as well. Yeah, and like some of the Glen players were obviously sh- shut down from an attacking point of view. But when you've Connor Glass coming uh, forward from midfield to score a couple, when you've Emmett Bradley knocking over some some frees, and obviously Danny Tallon had a big day there, uh, getting one four. You just you've an awful lot of uh, very powerful players uh, moving forward there. I think we've Chrissy McKay ready to come on now. Chrissy, how are things with you? I'm good. Is the technology okay? I've never heard. Wor- st- I've never heard of Streamyard in my life. <laughs> yeah, well, it's working okay. Well, just uh, so people know that uh, Chrissy, obviously of Schlock Neil, he joins us ahead of the 2022 AIB Ulster GA uh, hurling final against uh, Dunloy, which is this Saturday. That's going to be at the Athletics Ground in Armagh. The AIB GA All Ireland Club Championships features some of hashtag the toughest players from communities all across Ireland. It's these very communities that the players represent uh, that make the AIB GA All Ireland Club Championships unique. Now, in its 32nd year supporting the club championship. AIB is extremely proud to once again celebrate the communities that play such a role in sustaining our national games. Uh, how have things been with you, Chrissy, and how much are you looking forward to this match? Oh, busy, busy as usual. That's a good, that's a good excuse to have or a good thing to say, you know. So looking forward to the match, and you know, as as I've been saying today recently, um, I've never seen as much positivity and as much attention towards an Ulster club hurling game in my life so far. And that's the truth of it, and I think that's maybe reflective of. The fact that um, you know, Wilson and I do bring the best out of each other. We both bring big support from our own respective clubs, and it seems to be a very attractive game for the neutral, also. So, um, yeah, it bodes well, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Just talk to us about that, Chrissy. There's a lot of build up. up uh, there's a lot of build up between the two counties. Uh, there's obviously a lot of history between the between the two of you as well. 
from a neutral, just looking back here, we've been eyeing this one from a couple of weeks back. Obviously, you had to beat Porto Ferry before we got kind of the dream final that we wanted, but seems to be a, yeah, a big build-up about it. Yeah, a big build-up, and I think that's that's only good for us to hurl. I mean, and, and, the, and the GA calendar, we don't have too many days now where where Ulster hurling is is has got a game like this. So um yeah, it bodes well and I think it's reflective of the fact that the Law are getting better year by year dominating the Antrim Hurling Championship. We're still, you know, knocking around too and I think both teams have have um a quite a, a number of uh, young players and new players under their under their team. I know we have quite a few and um just uh, I suppose changes the vibe around things and mix the uh, mix the tie uh, different than it was in previous years and creates different conversations and different different narratives around the game. So, yeah, hopefully it's a big spectacle. Expecting a big crowd, lots of attention towards it. Um, it's all it's all positivity from what I see. I love the way you, word, you worded that. You talked about uh, Dunloy dominating us or dominating Antrim and you're still knocking about after doing eight or nine in a row up in Derry. That's a nice way of wording it. Ah, look, we are. We 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 have done well. I think the most the most exciting thing for me as a Slam Eel man is the fact that we're adding new players in. Um, I just I just think that's pivotal. Um, we don't want to be known as a club that you know only looks after our, our senior team and our senior teams going well um, are the only thing of importance in the club. As I was saying earlier to to the rest of the different journalists that have been appointed as the Slam Eel GPO in the last couple of months and. One of my remits now is to look massively at developing pathways and structures for our young players, looking at coach education and just look at um, increasing the standard across the club. And we have Rory O'Mena, and he's just turned 18 a couple of a, a couple of days ago, playing now Peter McCullough at 18-19, winged forward against Port of Ferry. We have Jack Cassidy at 19-20. We have, we have Shea Cassidy in, at, at uh, corner forward, who's just turned 20. So, you know, to have, you know, four or five players and a conveyor belt underneath that I would see a has a really good chance of playing senior sport for Slan Hill for a long number of years. To me, that actually motivates me because it, it it gives me a reason to hang around and it gives me a reason to to uh, to uh, increase my standard because it's it's exciting and um, I think that's a really good place that our that our club's currently in. Right, uh, Chrissy, just to to revert over to football for a couple of minutes. Obviously, you'd know Glenn very well now. The last couple of years, they've won those couple of Derry titles. How impressive are they? And it's a fairly tasty final with Kilku to come oh, up. Massively, massively. And uh, sadly, it's been at their expense the last two county finals. We just haven't been able to get near them. And like, like usually we're not found wanting too much. But in the last two finals, Glenn have beaten us comprehensively. There's no... I have no qualms at saying that, to be honest, um, Shane. So, look, that's the way it is. And you're right. It's an unbelievably attractive pairing, the Ulster Club football final. And, you know... Another structure or another sport, I, and, I, and I said the same last year, you know, Kilku and Glen could very easily be playing an Alarden club final because they're two of the best sides in the island. There's no question about that. So it's like ourselves and Dunloy. We have we have two very attractive um, parents in both the hurling and football. And um, oh, I, I'm not sure how you could call that. I think you'd be being slightly disrespectful to Kilku if you said they weren't slight favourites, being they're in an Alarden champions. But... Um, Glen are as good a side as there is in the country and they're playing Kilku in the Ulster final and it's just two of the best sides in the island going at it and managed fantastically by two different or two great different managerial teams littered with county players experience of playing in the competition um, it bodes for a big big day yeah and you've got some fairly big name managers there Conal Gilligan obviously and a fellow Derryman and Malachi O'Rourke as well so the experience they're bringing is huge I think it's just a, it's just um, sort of reflective across the uh, uh, across the island now. There's you know big name managers are being attracted to manage big name clubs because they see the the media coverage and the crowds going to games for club games now. I mean it's going to it's going to a different level. I mean I wouldn't say it's at the same level as under county, far from it. But when you look at Napierce and Bolly Gunner last week battle it out, uh, oh. That's at a scary, scary level. Like, and um, you know, Glenn and Kilku can certainly say the same in terms of the level that game will be at tactically, physically, the men that are managing the teams. I mean, it's an exciting time for Gaelic games. The standards going up, and I think that's something that we all should embrace and not be getting too caught up in the narrative of you know 
Um, uh, it's only it's only an amateur game, and is it getting too serious? I I understand the logic in that argument and there's things, but to me it's so refreshing and so exciting to see the standards um, um, across the board going up, and um, it's a great time to be involved in Gaelic games. I I heard that uh, well. I believe you played Bally Gunner in a challenge match not so long ago. When you look at last year, you were only five points behind in the All-Ireland semi-final. went very well. Um, did you play them this year? How are, they, how are they going? We didn't play them this year, no. Um, we played a challenge game a few weeks ago against Nice, which is a really good game. They're a really good level too. And, you know, put it up to Valley Hill at the weekend. So, yeah, that was a good game to get. Um, I think it's well documented at this stage that we played each other. So, I don't think I'm giving anything away, Shane, there. So, no, we didn't, we didn't play Bally Gunner. Um, but look, we're very aware that yes, the last couple of campaigns against the likes of Ballyhill and Ballygunner in particular have been hurtful defeats and they've been very competitive. But we know that we have to improve and we feel that we still have a lot of room to improve. I suppose in some ways it's similar to the Derry football one when you reflect on it. It's not as if, you know, we're at this stage, we're going, we're an aging team where we can't find new players or we can't find ways to improve. That's exactly the opposite. We know we have so much scope to improve, the ambitions there to improve, the support from the clubs there to improve. So whether we ever get to that level or, or, or give ourselves the opportunities to get to that level again will remain to be seen. But I tell you one thing, it won't be down to lack of ambition or, or, or lack of trying, that's for sure. Mm. Michael? Just something you touched on there, Chrissy. Um, you mentioned that Kilku and Glenn could easily play in an All Ireland final if that was the way we've talked about here before. About we'd love to see it. I don't know if it, if it's ever even a possibility, like a Champions League style format at club level where the county champions, where where you could be playing Ballyhale in a group stage, even or something like that. Is that something that I'd imagine that's something you take your hand off for? Look, it's a, you know I'm glad that you're saying things like that because I do believe that we can structurally make things so much better within our games there's no question about that but then I suppose you're always opening yourself up to them sort of conversations where does the provincial system fit within them sort of ideas so that's a tricky one but I suppose from our perspective and from an Ulster Hurling perspective in general is you know how can how can Ulster teams forgetting about who won their county championship how can we get as Ulster teams, more games against the the top sides um, in the big Harlem counties down south, the likes of Kilkenny's and the Corks and the Galways and the Tipperary's and the Waterfords and so on and so forth. To me, that'll be a really good template because we struggle to get them sort of games on a regular basis, and it does it does affect us because we're not getting as much access to that really high level of hurling. And I think you need that access to that high level of hurling to see where you're really at in the pecking order and see the lessons that, that can be learned. I mean, we have seen massive improvements from the first day out against Kula to where we find ourselves now. And that has only came from being being um, exposed to the highest level of hurling. And yes, it's, it was very daunting at the start, as, as, as Shane will testify against Kula. But, you know, the ability to say we're not good enough yet let's be good enough and to, and to knuckle down and improve is very much a mentality that exists within our club. Yeah, there's an interesting question here from James S. He said, well done on the All-Star, Christy. Well deserved. Oh, Chrissy, not Christy. Uh, <laughs> who, who was your toughest ever opponent? And I suppose Bo Coles, actually, really. Who was? Yeah. Who was? Well, I, I, don't, I don't find myself having too many man-marking jobs in hurling. It's more of, a, maybe more of an attacking or more of, a, of a, a different role. You know, football have been, have been over the years, there's been no shortage of top quality opponents. I mean, you know, like uh, Michael Murphy is definitely up there. Matty Donnelly is definitely up there. Dermot Connolly is definitely up there. You know, you know, there's just so many. I've been exposed to such a high level of opponent that it's very difficult to give them all their due respect. But I think in any given day when you go out now and you mark players, to me it's very much, I hate going into a game marking a player that's ripped it up the last game because a forward and form is a different animal. Um, so to me, that's a different spin to that or a different answer to that question of, you know, and this year, unfortunately, I was going on a lot of the time against players who were in good form. Sharpshooters in good form are a different proposition. So, you know, Darren McCurry this year was as tricky uh, operator as I've ever met physically, his, his intelligence, his accuracy too. You know, just so many talented players throughout our game and um, it's not always an enjoyable proposition go up against them i'd be lying if i said it was can i uh, can i talk to you about your mentality going into a job <laughs> like that chrissy um because without being smart like 
football or hurling, you want to generally most people want to get on the ball. That's not really your modus operandi on a day like that. So talk to me about your mentality and how you have to steal yourself. Do, like, do you ever find yourself going out maybe to try and give a one two with someone and then they're like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on a second here now. I I've won this. What's my primary job here? Is it difficult yeah. to steal yourself? I think it's less difficult when you're maybe man marking within the full back line because a lot of the top forwards now they're coached to stay close to goal. Obviously, they're a lot more dangerous in there. It's a different man marking position when you're maybe out the pitch where you can actually make them think about going the other way. But the smart forwards now are so intelligent that the inside forward line ones they won't follow you the full length of the pitch. They'll pass you on, and you're going to yourself, uh, "Do I really want to tire myself out going up the pitch here and making a minimal impact?" Or do I want to conserve my energy marking this guy to death? Um, I don't have the energy for both, so I just pick the one that um, that the defender should do, um, and that is hard enough on its own. But I think it's a different, it is a different proposition depending on where that forward plays. For example, I could understand the way Lee Keegan would always put Conley in the back foot when he's playing the half forward line because Conley would have to follow him, and and, and being around the half back line, you have to get on the ball when you're playing full back or corner back you're not really required that much to get on the ball and if, if if you can nullify or stop somewhat the marquee forward i think it gives your team a better chance of winning so ultimately that's the question i always ask what gives the team the best chance of winning because um to me that's what i want to be as a player i want to be a winner and i want to be involved in winning teams last question can... on that and just just last question on that. i'm just wondering have you been like unbelievably happy with a display where you mightn't have hand pat you like you may, might have never hardly touched the ball before? I like, got the ball in your hands even in a game. Sorry, say it again. No, I'm just wondering: is there any game that you can remember where you're thinking, "Just I played really well here," but you probably you mightn't have even got the ball in your hands in that game, if you get me? Uh, yeah, look, and and that's and that's part of it. I think you have to be, and I'm involved in coaching myself, or or like to be involved in coaching now and again myself. And if I was going out to manage a team or coach a team, and we we look at the key players and the other teams, you know, um, it's a really hard job for for you to shut down that player and, and 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 part of that is to shut down that player with with um there, there has to be a calculated way of doing it now what i advocate at times the way i man mark the other players perhaps not but there's certain you just have to go down that path you know so um um i wouldn't be too badly worried um about about getting on on the ball too much but maybe in, in the modern game i might have to look a bit maybe opening myself up a wee bit at times yeah because i was just thinking about and i know they're further out the field when uh, brendan rogers was against michael murphy so it's not the same as you marking someone close to goal but if you can get forward and get a point or two like brendan was doing for the forward that's that's a bit soul destroying too isn't it, it puts you under pressure absolutely there's nothing there there's there, that's definitely another way of doing it but what i find is and i, I think it just depends on the team like what i have found is teams are so smartly coached nowadays the marquee forward or the, the real sharpshooter will usually play on the six yard box play really close to goal which is a scary proposition because you know as a defender one slip or the right ball in and it can just end in goal go goal, goal um so brennan's remit this year was a wee bit different but it probably suited us because he's a better attacker than me probably now um he's more legs and he's he's got uh, unbelievable pace as we know so i would love to maybe this year if a forward out the pitch and is able to follow him and attack a bit more but um, I think at this stage, Mr. Gallagher likes me close to goal, and um, whilst it's okay at times, it's um, as you, as we all know, it can be a scary enough thing. Can you think of how any scary, other manager? How, yeah, how scary would this be? People Ooh. want to see Clifford v Chrissy. Yeah, it would be scary. He's, I think he he will go down as the best of all time. Um, scary, scary, scary. But at the same time, I think I think as a player, I've always had this stance throughout my career. I want to go and try myself against the best. Um, now, any 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 defender that's saying that David Clifford wouldn't be an unbelievably hard and scary task, but ultimately, as a player, you want to say when you finish playing, you played against the best, you tested yourself against the best, and um, I wouldn't be the first player that David Clifford's got the better of. So, what I have to lose. Yeah, your your former Derry hurling teammate uh, Nisha Waldron says, "What's the story of the Schlock Neil boys being opposites for hurling and football? Rogers and Chrissy defending in football, attacking and hurling, and Shane McGuigan the opposite too." 
Aye, that's a strange one. It's 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 one that Rory Gallagher can't get his head around either. Um, he wouldn't know much about hurling, and um, but he 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 does keep us going about hurling and, and laughing and joking. But um, aye, it's, it's definitely a strange one. But one thing that we have evolved this year with, make no secret of it, we were a lot more adaptable. Shane Shane has been playing midfield this year, whereas before he's been playing in defence. Um, so he's maybe more of attack, and I moved back into defence now and things like that. So. We have good adaptability, and I think when you look at the top hurling sides over the last number of years, Bally Yales, the Bally Gunners, the Coolers, the ability to adapt and for players to play in certain positions makes you a lot more difficult to play against, and that's something that we're aware of and trying to evolve as, you know. So just a question about Rory Gallagher. Can you think of any other manager whose voice carries as much as his does? Because like, if you're watching a Derry game on TV, you can barely hear the commentary with Rory roaring on the sideline. He's he's a serious man, and you should hear him in the training pitch. Um, it's even worse. But behind all of that, there's an intelligence and a charisma that I've never seen better than. And he's if he's watching this or hears this, he's going to be a smileless face because he's saying McCaig's giving me a compliment, which doesn't happen too often. But he really is. His intelligence, his IQ, his charisma his style of man managing away from the pitch and talking to players and chatting to players is brilliant too. I mean, you know, and and again, you're, you know, any anybody that, that thinks about it is going to say, well, of course that's true because gone are the days of shouting and roaring along the sideline and getting the best out of the team. You might think that the way he's doing it, but it's a very different approach the vast majority of the time. And um, um, he might even tone it down a wee bit this year, but I doubt it. <laughs> and then I suppose just coming back to Dunloy again this weekend, they have some classy forwards, especially the ones coming to mind is Conal Cunning, of course. And I know he's a midfielder, but Keelan Malloy, what a player he is going forward. Yeah, and that's the thing about it, isn't it? They're it's like the Port of Ferry lads last week, and then even to a bigger extent this week, having a lot of lads that are playing under County Horn at a really good standard gives them a really good platform for Horn um, at club level. We can't say the same, unfortunately. Yes, we have a lot of lads playing for Derry Horn and had a relatively decent year last year. But for the Antrim lads and the Loy lads to be playing at that sort of Joe McDonnell level and indeed beyond it now gives them a really good platform. And they're hurling throughout the majority of the year where we're not. So that's something we're conscious of, but it's not an excuse. And um, it means that we're going to be on our game and give the Loy the full respect that we always do. But um, of course, Keelan Malloy and Connell Cunning are on our radar because they're two superstar players and two of the best players in Ulster at the minute and they've had two fantastic years for or the two of them have had fantastic years for Antrim also playing at a really good level so hey it bodes well I want to be playing against the best and Deloy are certainly one of the best in Ulster yeah I think we're both really looking forward to that game well all three of us you are, are obviously too final question then before we let you go the, Mickey Hart there was a big story that he was mm -hmm. going to Schlock Neil uh, what was your understanding of it? Well, I can fill you in. So we'd be disappointed with some of the, the journalism that, that came out about it. Thankfully, a lot of the journalists then reached out to the club and asked about the truth of the story. And obviously, there was no substance to the story. But it probably did grow legs from the fact that Gavin Devlin, who's assistant manager with Mickey and has been for a long time, trained us um, for two years. Um, the COVID year won the championship. Gavin was instrumental. And... The year after, Glenn beat us in the final. Gavin was there, albeit less, uh, less that year because Louth were back and then our county season was going. So I'm fairly sure that's where it grew legs from. Um, and that was the link there because Gavin's obviously still involved with Louth, was involved with us. But um, I just think sometimes we talk about journalists gaining um, or you know, not wanting guarded interviews and guarded questions from players, but... When you see that type of journalism being spouted about, it's understandable why players then would be guarded and things like that. I think it's all always important to check your sources out and to ask people the truth first before things are publicised because it's very easy for things to grow legs. But I'm glad you've asked that question and I'm glad I'm able to give you the truthful answer to it. There was no substance to it, but if Mickey Hart's listening and he's free in years to come, would we be interested? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. That's a come and get me plea, if I ever heard one. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chrissy. Brilliant as always. Really Pleasure, appreciate lads. it. Thank you very much. See Thanks, Chrissy. Come on. Yeah, so um, the, the flip side of it is, I suppose, any, anyone who's wondering what the journalist side of it is, in this situation, I'm not entirely sure how it panned out, but oftentimes you'd, you'd ask a team to confirm 
you know, a story and uh, they're not going to tell you one way or another. So sometimes uh, journalists do take a punt. So that's why that sort of stuff does happen. So there's there's kind of two sides to it. Uh, yeah, I do agree with Chrissy. It is a two-way street. It'd be, you need trust on both sides. Uh, sometimes if you have a story and you're trying to confirm it or whatever, uh, and it is the truth, and you ask the, the team or the club or whatever, they will um, potentially not confirm it and release a statement where everybody has it then rather than just you or just me. So it's no longer our story and it's everybody's story. So that's maybe sometimes why people take a punt. But um, yeah, that was, that was it. I, I thought he might shirk the question. Anything but. Mm, absolutely not. Um, so Rory probably deserves way more credit than he got for Donegal winning the All Ireland, says Mikey K. Obviously, talking about Rory Gallagher. Uh, the Ulster Intermediate semi finals, Galvalley Pierce has beat on Cluck on Leah 112 to 10. Cardiff, Soft Castle Rahan, nine points to 1 5. The Ulster Junior final, penalties again. Stewartstown beat Drum Lane 5 uh, 4 in that one. The Ladies All Ireland Senior Football semi final, Dunlamine beat Kilmacud Croaks. 111 to uh, to seven points. And I think I'll just bring up the video. Uh, you might give some of the background here while I'm bringing up the video. Yeah, this is brilliant. So Katrina McConnell uh, was married or got married the day before. So she skipped the day two of her wedding to play an All-Ireland semi-final, which is, uh, and this is her arriving via helicopter. So the game was played in Dunamoyne, so she's arriving via helicopter. To her club grounds, and not only that did she arrive by helicopter, but she kicked seven points as the beat Kilma could uh, and denied them a potential All Ireland treble at the moment because they're still in the hurling of football. So it's just a, it's a bit of a mad one. Um, there's obviously some fair sacrifices involved, but sure they had to look after themselves a little bit more at the wedding than they normally would. Um, but it didn't seem to affect their game at all, or didn't knock them off their game at all. Um, and she kicked seven points, and they're in All Ireland final now, and they're going to be playing. The defending champions in it, uh, Kilcar and Clumburn had a you know real comprehensive win over Bally McCarby. Um, Bally McCarby, and yeah, they're looking primed for for two in a row now. But uh, a helicopter landing is probably not a bad way to finish off what's been a what's been a mad show. Great to have the two lads on board as well, and uh, both kind of very open and honest, and especially the week of a match, which is not something you can always say. Yeah, and that uh, video was taken by Jerome Quinn. It was on the LGFA site. Um, just she put her hand fair close to the blades of the of the helicopter. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh jeez. So yeah, as you said, Kilcarran and Clonburn they'll be in the final. Uh, in the uh, intermediate football semi-finals, Mullinahone they beat Derry Gunnelly after extra time. Longford Slashers beat Charlestown. So those two teams will meet in the final. And the junior semi-finals, Nave Abon beat Castle Blaney Fogs. And Saltel Nocknacara had a little bit too much for all the wires. So that's it for the show this week. Quick little go to the week. Quick little go to the oh, week. Oh, you have me. You have me. Yeah. Uh, you have to get me really. I'm going to give it to Mark. Cal- I'm going to give it to Mark Caulfield uh, for St. Thomas's to score one three. Not bad. Uh, in the football side of things, in. Uh, who will I go with? I haven't a clue. <laughs> I haven't I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it the goat of the week is Katrina McConnell. <laughs> for the yeah. for have playing an All Ireland semi final and kicking seven points on the day two of your wedding, uh, it's not exactly something you uh, you see every day. Yeah, uh, SSRI says legendary show as always. Love the crack and banter. Honda Slasher says Jack. Um, so one of the O'Shea's of Fossa says Jack Nulty. I'd say that's a first player arriving at a match by helicopter. Okay, so huge amount covered on the show as always. A, a reminder that we're sponsored by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game and get 15% off. Also, if you're around Dublin this weekend, Saturday at midday, we're going to have a brilliant coaching clinic out at UCD. Ger Brennan, Paul Galvin, and Stephen Poacher, who's obviously been on the show plenty of times over the last number of years. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. The link to where you can buy the tickets is in the video description. Mikey, we've it all said. All said, Shane. Touch it towards that.